Hello, and welcome to this Indie Plus Demos Lovecraft-esque, a game by Becky Anison and Josh Fox. Uh, this game, just to call it out immediately, is currently, as of this recording, still on Kickstarter. So if you're watching this and you would like to know more, please head on over to the Kickstarter page. We will put the link to it in the uh, description. And uh, go ahead, read about it, and back it, because it's a cool game. Um, so to get us started, this event will uh, be in accordance with the Indie Plus community standards. If you'd like to know about what those are, please go to IndiePlus.org. Um, and just to set up a sort of quick content warning, imagine this is probably going to be rated R. Uh, we're not going to put cursing off the table. We're not going to put uh, violence or violent content, um, blood or gore, off the table. This is very much going to be a horror game. And while it is Lovecraftian horror and therefore much more likely to be largely psychological, we're also leaving that on the table as options, especially towards the end of the game. Uh, we will not have sexual violence, um, but... In the event that it does come up, again, it is somewhat unlikely that it will, or at least not obvious that it will, based on the, the horror content of the game, but sexual content, period, is not off the table. So, again, very much imagine rated R. Um, all right, so to get us started, uh, my name is Brendan Conway, and I posed to everybody here today the issue of you would have to state your favorite horror thing, and immediately realized this question imposed a burden upon myself that I did not anticipate. Um, but it is in my head of late because of work I've been doing with uh, Marissa Kelly. So I'm going to actually go ahead and, and say right out the gate, Alien. Um, I watched it again most recently, and um, the, the movie is just really, really creepy, unsettling. Um, unnerving. It does the perfect mix of like the, the slow buildup, the fact that the alien doesn't even come in for a long time. Um, it's just very artful and one of my favorite horror things of all time, not to mention space. So that's me. Um, Matt S., would you like to introduce yourself? Um, hi, I'm Matt Schultz. Um, and the horror thing would be the Cats of Ulthar. I mean, if I had to pick something. But I love craft. <laughs> I just like, cause it's the one where the Guy beats up or kills a cat, and the cats come and eat him or something. It's kind of a. <laughs> it, it's not. That's not even the thing. I mean, it's been a while since I last read it, but I mean, it's kind of that one where it's something happens, and then other something else happens, but you never know really what happens. You just sort of like hints at the horror behind it all. I, I like it. I also have to say that your summary was perhaps the best summary of a Lovecraft story I've ever heard. Guy kills a cat, cats come and eat him. <laughs> that, was, that was awesome. <laughs> I would read that story. <laughs> uh, all right, Matt H. Um, so it's not really a Lovecraft story, but my, the horror story that will always stick with me because I watched it when I was way too young and was therefore really scarred by it was The Thing, which was, I think, the John Carpenter 1980s version. My God. <laughs> that, that will be with me forever. Major effects and puppets galore. Yep. And um, it's all that over the top eighties horror special effects too, so you know it's you know it's coming. <laughs> awesome. And um, Brandon, would you like to introduce yourself? Yep. Uh, I'm Brandon Lemos and I realized when Matt and Brendan introduced theirs that they actually listed two of my favorite horror movies of all time. Uh, but luckily I planned ahead, and I, I think my favorite kind of genre of horror is one people don't tend to think of. It's the it's giant monster movies. Um, people tend to kind of see them as action and the spectacle, and most of them are. Uh, but they got their, they root, were rooted originally in the horror genre. Um, the original Godzilla, 1956, um, along with uh, more recently the Cloverfield, uh, kind of brought it back to that genre, and I really enjoy those types of movies with that kind of sort of a crossover between horror and natural disaster. Yep. Awesome. Uh, so now that we have grounded ourselves in the horror that we most enjoy, we will begin with Lovecraft-esque, a game which is designed very strongly to help us produce a story in the vein of Lovecraft's own tales about a, a single character, a witness, encountering the strange, the unexplainable, um, tension building slowly over time, and eventually encountering some horror at the end of the tale. 
Um, so one of the first things that we will do is this uh, game, actually I will, I will flag this immediately for our viewers. We here discussed it um, after I reviewed the text and I, I had communicated a bit uh, with the creators of the game, Becky Anderson and Josh Fox, and they indicated that for first time players it's helpful to have a little bit more time than the two hours we usually do for an exhibition game. So in this case, um, we may go a little bit longer in order to better do the best job of showing off this game in its fullest capacity. Um, so, that said, we will move on to the uh, wonderful little teaching guide that this game provides. It has a script uh, for how to best present and teach the game that we will follow for a little bit to introduce some of the rules, uh, reading its pieces out loud. Um, so, I will start it off as the facilitator. Um, him. We are going to use this teaching guide to help us learn the game. We'll read it out section by section as we play so that we're not trying to learn all the rules in one go. If you've got questions, feel free to ask me, but don't worry if in the early scenes you aren't sure how later stuff is going to work. We'll come to it in due course. Uh, this is a storytelling game to recreate the slow building cosmic horror of H.P. Lovecraft. We're going to take turns to reveal, clues, reveal strange clues one scene at a time. We won't discuss where the story is going, but after each scene, we'll privately leap to conclusions about what the clues mean, and then use those speculations to steer our contributions to the story. In the end, one of us will weave it all together into a terrifying finale. Each scene, we'll take turns to play the witness, the narrator, and the watchers. The witness is the main character who gradually uncovers a terrible and human secret. They may struggle to overcome that secret, but are doomed to fail and perhaps meet a terrible end. The narrator reveals strange clues, describes the piece, people, places, and events that the witness is caught up in and plays walk-on parts. The watchers help the narrator by adding layers of atmosphere and horrifying details, by revealing extra clues, and by playing secondary characters if required by the narrator. Before we start, we'll all have to have a clear picture of the kind of story we want to tell. Lovecraftian horror stories are about a vast, uncaring universe full of lurking monsters, alien civilizations, and terrifying gods that make human concerns seem meaningless. They don't include ghosts or werewolves or any of the monsters you see in classic gothic horror stories, folk tales, or Hollywood horror movies. Lovecraft describes alien monsters like those found in modern science fiction and presents them as the denizens of an arcane horror story. The stars in space are vast and terrifying, not wondrous or inspiring. Lovecraft supports this with ancient tomes full of blasphemous secrets and sorcerers casting sinister rituals to summon abominations from beyond. All of this is supported by a tone reminiscent of gothic horror, elaborate arcane language, forbidding and unfriendly locations, people hideous on the inside and out who serve these alien masters and layer upon layer of relentless detail to heighten the tense atmosphere. We start by agreeing who our witness will be and the setting for the story. We'll go through the stuff we have to agree one thing at a time, and everyone should throw in suggestions and discuss them until we're all happy. If we get stuck, there are inspiration tables in the rule book that we can look at for ideas. Okay, so the stuff we will have to decide right now are the era and general setting for the story, the main location, one other location per player, the name and role of the witness, why they are at the main location, one personality trait, and their source of strength. Okay. So to get us started, the first thing is the tone. Uh, this is just to make sure we're all on the same page about the kind of horror we're doing, right? So, so that nobody is surprised when certain things come true. The suggested tones um, include the general Lovecraft slow-building brooding horror with an emphasis on the witness as a largely helpless observer of the horror. Investigative horror, where the witness is actively working to uncover it, like so that's not just stumbling upon it, it's you are purposefully investigating it. Heroic horror, where you may not be doomed, the witness may not be doomed, it may actually win, who wants to play that, that's up now. Um, and comedy horror, where the conventions of the genre are deliberately parodied. The key is just to make sure we're all on the same page. So what do you all think? Which, what tone do we want to aim for? I want to point out that it completely defeats the purpose to play heroic horror to have it be a Lovecraft story. I'm just saying. <laughs> if there's a chance of winning, it is not a Lovecraft story. Fair enough. All right, so not heroic horror, 
Yeah, I knew you. I knew you too would not want heroic horror. Um, <laughs> I'm I'm a fan of investigative horror. I think it kind of lends itself more to a structured plot, especially for kind of a first time go through. It's a little easier to explain why this person is not running for the nearest exit, screaming and gibbering. Mm-hmm. I'm good with that. Uh, what about you, Matt? What do you think? Uh, I have to say the same with investigative horror. I mean. All right. So if we're all cool with that, Matt, uh, Matt H., are you cool with investigative horror? All right. So let us say our tone is investigative horror, which I will now type into the sheet using my horribly clickety clackety keyboard. You can imagine it's a typewriter. Investigative horror. Okay. Ding. Um, now we should decide if there are any elements we want to ban. Um, examples might include overt or allegorical racism, characters who go mad, specific themes that anybody finds particularly distasteful, specific elements that anybody finds particularly uninteresting, like cultists. Um, this is just making sure we're all on the same page and we're all comfortable with the kind of things that we can bring into the game. So is there anything to call out that anybody wants to make sure that we are not using? And to be very clear, uh, the game also suggests using the X card, which we can use over the course of the game if anything does come up that you are like, nope, 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 nope. You can just make an X sign or even type X card into the chat, and we will just basically rewind that thing didn't happen, no explanation needed, and we're all good. Um, so we don't have to flag everything literally right this second. But if there is anything that comes up right now, something that stands out that you would prefer not to come in, let's bring it up right now. So does anybody have anything that comes to mind that you'd like to take out? Um, I mean, I definitely, I kind of agree with the, the mention of kind of the racism aspect. I just don't know if this is the best venue in which to deal with that, so. I muted myself to type. I agree. So, so let's take out racism. Um, so, so it's basically just that's not something that we are going to be interested in including or dealing with. Uh, anything else? That's okay. Cool. And again, if anything comes up, feel free to make the X card sign or, or type it into the chat. Um, all right. Now we need to decide what era the story is set in. Uh, traditionally, Lovecraft stories are 1890s or 1920s. We can do any other period we want. We can even do modern or futuristic stories if we want. Uh, we should also pick where the story is set, like a broad setting, uh, but also a primary location to focus on. Um, so ideal locations are, uh, oh, I think that's for the long list, but um, the old, decaying, dark, unexplored, abandoned, full of strange things or with an unpleasant history. Uh, there are inspiration tables in our PDF documents that you can look at if you ever uh, want to have some ideas of the kinds of locations that would work very well. Um, so first of all, what era? What do we think for era? I kind of like 1920s. Um, 1920s? Yeah, I mean, I... It works for me. I don't know. Okay. Somebody, yes or no? Yeah, no, I mean, I'm fine with that. I'm, I, I enjoy... And it's just simple, a little far back, and... Yeah. Uh, I don't know. It's a, the classic time period. 1920s, 1920s it is. Sounds good. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, then where... Where is the story set? Broad setting and then, like, a central primary location. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, the broad setting could be, you know, London, New York, Boston, whatever. Uh, but a specific, like, primary location from which to center things could be, like, um, the ancestral home or museum or whatever. So what, what do you think for the overarching location? Where are we setting this? I'm thinking about hmm. yeah I'm, I'm gold thinking. fields of Alaska say it again <laughs> gold fields of Alaska <laughs> I want to make sure I'm hearing right are you saying gold, gold. or like gold 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 G-O-L-D yeah. is that cool with everybody yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I, th I think that's it's kind really of... a really dark and dilapidated place in the 1920s, so let's do it. 
and it deals with the uh, kind of a theme of isolation that I think is is oftentimes a com common occurrence, but it's in a setting that really I don't think has been fully explored, particularly for this time period. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm a history teacher, and I don't know much about what happened in the 1920s in Alaska. I like it. All right. Yeah. That means I can make stuff up. Um, excellent. Okay, so the gold fields of Alaska. Uh, what crazy. is the primary location? What What is our, like... Um, Initial primary location that we are focusing on. Uh, you want a town? Sure. We could do a town. Uh, like the um, small. What do you want to say? Like this. Essentially, it's it's the the town connected to the the gold field operation, right? Like. Yeah. So I'm trying to think of it. Uh... Damn it! Um, I remember it from they had those those games. It wasn't Oregon Trail, but it was something like that. Yukon, Alaska, Yukon. You could do Yukon. We can come up with like a, a nice little tiny little town name too. I'm thinking like Cold Gold, but that's terrible. Um, Pilot Point. Say that again. Pilot Point. Pilot Point. Is that cool, to everybody? Yeah, that sounds fine. Where in Alaska is Pilot Point? <laughs> Uh, I'm gonna send you a picture, actually. Oh, okay. Well, no, that makes a big difference. So, where you are in Alaska, I mean. No, I love this. It's the greatest location too. I'm gonna post it in the chat here, so you can pull that up. It's like on the, you know, Alaska has the trailing edge out into the ocean. It's mm -hmm. right on the corner of the mainland and the trailing edge, basically. Yeah, I see that. I'm trying to see if I can. Get a version of it to come up on my screen so I can share it with anybody who'd be watching. But it appears that the technology has betrayed me. As as of 2010, the population of the city was 68. That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I imagine that it would kind of be the and it would make sense with I think the gold rush was mostly around the the 1890s. Yeah, this so, is over the tail end of the. Big tail end of the gold rush. Yeah, so this this could be like, especially since it's in the south, it could be a, a place that was originally established. Like there was a strut, like they struck gold, but it turns out it wasn't a very deep mm. mine, and so okay. people are starting yeah. are already starting to clear out. Um, All right, so census data says that in 1940 it had a population of 114. So this is a town of about 150 people at the time period that we're. Although we could make it smaller. There you go. Go away. Oh, okay. Well, there it is. Whee! All right. So, Pilot Point. Um, tiny little town. Let's actually... Um, it, so, we're saying, like, it's at the end of the gold rush. The town is probably... It's small. Uh, it's not vibrant. Like, there's not much gold there. Uh, so people are not flocking to it anymore. It does have plenty of abandoned buildings and structures that may once have supported a stronger uh, presence here for the gold fields. Um, excellent. And uh, I'm sort of, I think we should have a a specific main location, or it's, it's not a bad idea just to have one in general. So, like, what main location... Or no, wait, I'm looking at this. I'm, I see in a village in the highlands or a fishing village clinging to a rocky shore or a farming village clinging to tradition. So this works great. That's what this is. This is a settlement. Um, a dying town with only a handful of inhabitants. That's perfect. Uh, excellent. All right, so I'm imagining this place doesn't have any large buildings. It, it, it almost, in my head, is looking like a western town, practically. Mm. Um, like at, out of Deadwood or something. Um Three awesome. steps away from Ghost Town. Yeah, yeah, that's oh, that's that's a perfect description. So two steps away from Ghost Town. Well, I said three, but <laughs> we're we're two two. one step closer. <laughs> All right, excellent. All right, so that is our main location, Pilot Point, two steps away from being a Ghost Town. Now let's do some other locations. Everybody gets to add one per player. Um, you get to do this independently, but let's say them out loud as we add them, so that uh, anybody who's watching can hear them. And uh, separate places or more specific places within the main location you've already chosen. So this could be like um, the bar, as well as it could be the weird caverns, um, or whatever. So let's each add one. I will go ahead, and, and again, I want to call out these inspiration tables are fantastic and very useful. 
um, for trying to figure out what to use. So I'm going to go ahead and look at this and pick. Did it? Did it? Did it? Um, <laughs> the moon. Um, I'm going to pick. I think I really like the idea of like a cave network. So I'm going to pick um, a barely charted cave network. It was the kind of thing where um, they just started investigating caves near the fields, uh, like in some in some nearby mountain areas or, or something uh, along these islands. They started investigating caves, and the money dried up before they could get very deep at all. So there's the barest of entry into the caves, and then they go much deeper, but nobody really knows where they go. It could be that they're flooded, because we are sort of amid the water. Um, so it could be they're flooded, it could be they're impassable, but there are these caves near the town, and they've been there for a long time. Uh, Matt S., what location will you add? Uh, let's go with the uh, the Flanagan Manor. Awesome. Uh, is the Flanagan Manor dilapidated? Yeah, it's, um, I kind of see this as they were the, I don't know, these towns usually had like a baron or not a baron, but they were the people that made the most money out of the town. And so, yeah, so this man manor house. It's like on the highest point in the town, and it's all rickety and it's going. It's it's on its way out just like the town is, but, I mean, it's but it's a big house. So it's... I like it. And and we can, we don't have to answer. I'm totally cool leaving it for the moment, whether or not Flanagan still live there. Uh, that's cool. All right, Brandon, what location are you adding? Uh, it's, uh, I'm going to add the town or the... the Golden Salmon Tavern. Because um, I mean, I, 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 this is by down by the water. It's uh, very likely that in the with the loss of gold as a revenue, most of the people who are left are probably doing fishing because there's not a heck of a lot else around. Um, so they're you know they they work long hours. They get back in. They probably go and go to the only social place like the, the, the only social place in town. Um, Which is the golden salmon. Yeah. Yeah, I like So it. named because salmon is the primary uh, industry of this town currently. <laughs> but we wish it was gold. <laughs> we so wish it was gold. Mm. Excellent. Still, still dreaming of that solid gold salmon. <laughs> what about you, Matt? What are you adding? Um, I'm going to add... Let's go with... I'm going to add the... Uh, Pilot Point Railway Station, which is, of course, the end of the line. And it is a poorly tended but still functional and usable railway station. Because you have to get in and out of town and, and ship your stuff somehow. And, and I can see that, like, that might lead up to s the closest possible, um, I don't know, port or someplace nearby that's, like, the closest thing to an actual real town. Right. Um, yeah, yeah, I like that a lot. This, they probably shipped um, gold and material in and out, but, you know, mm. not used for that so much anymore. Great, okay. Uh, so we now have our locations. Now it is time to do the witness. Who is the witness? What is their name and role? Pick one character to be the focus of the story. You don't need the witness to be particularly heroic, and in our case they probably aren't, but they are investigative because we settled on investigative horror. Um, and we probably want somebody who's also sympathetic and engaging. Um, mm -hmm. So... We need to pick our witness's name, their role, their reason for being here, um, one personality trait to act as an anchor to collectively play this character, and a source of strength 
for the witness. That keeps them grounded and forces them to continue against all odds. This could be another personality trait, like rationality or optimism, or something external, like religion or family. Uh, we will develop the witness further on, so we don't have to fill in every blank right now. Um, all right, so first things first. What is their name and role? Hmm. Hmm. What do you think here? Um, for for role, I kind of was having an idea of. Um, I, I was trying to kind of. Think, I mean, we're, we're doing investigatives. We want someone who's going to poke around and someone's going to investigate. But I mean, oftentimes the, there's kind of the stereotypical professions. I was thinking actually maybe someone who's working for a company on the con, you know, on the lower forty-eight. Uh, so someone who's kind of a. Um, real estate surveyor. Um, you know, this is before... Alaska is not a state yet. Alaska is just kind of a territory, and it's open season. Um, so maybe a, a company is looking to... look into any any number of different... Like, tourism or, right. or other resources. Um, if they can do something with it. So, yeah. so essentially, their job is to go to the ass end of the Earth and or America and see if places are worth doing yeah. something with. They're like a, like a land surveyor. Nice. Land surveyor. Excellent, okay. Um, all right, so let's go with land surveyor, and then let us give them a name. Uh, man or woman? My inclination is to say woman, but given the time period, it's probably a bit more reasonable. Um, but then again... Uh, Square the time period. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it could be that this is the. I mean, again, this is the this is the wild west. This is the there, uncharted territory. This might be where only place you could go to be a professional. There's an interesting thing here too. Yeah, where I can see that if she had worked her way up as a land surveyor, right? Like they are like, oh great, we're gonna send you to Alaska. <laughs> We've yeah. got this place we want you to check out. And she's like, you know what? I'm going to do it, and I'm going to do it well, because screw all of you. Do you want to... So, so is that cool with everybody? Mm-hmm. Yeah, right, yeah, it's fine. Let's give her a name. I, I think... I always think of Alice as, like, a very old-timey name. So I'm stuck on Alice, and then let's give her... When say Alice, I think the Red Queen from Resident Evil. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's a horror reference, so we're fine. <laughs> we I can yeah. change it. I'm fine with changing it, too. Um, there's a part of me, and, and this might be pushing it, but I also find it interesting if she was a Flanagan. Okay. But that, no, that might be pushing that. it, though. Right? Like, she's here for the land surveyor. I don't know. What do you, what do you guys think? I kind of like that, actually. I'd almost, I mean, I'd say um, she's a Flanagan, but maybe it's not, it's not, well, I'd say it's not, not obvious in the name, maybe. She changed her name intentionally? Or she could be a widower, I mean. She could. Yeah. Maybe they're a, another branch of the family that went north to strike mm. it rich and then kind of fell out of touch with the, the family back home. That works. The Alice... How about Alice Eckert? How does that work? Okay. Works for me. All right, Alice Eckert. Why are they here? So her role is this land surveyor, and she's here because her company sent her here, ultimately, right? Or is she actually here because of this connection to the Flanagans? Or both? Could be why she was sent or why she accepted what was probably a, a really kind of a dead-end yeah. job. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so, so you want to meld them together. So she was sent here by her company, but she also accepted it because of her connection to the Flanagans. That works. So she was sent here by her company. Can we give her company a quick name? Just something, sil or something simple that we can uh, refer to it by, like, I don't know, um, Pearson and Ives. Is that okay with everybody? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Pearson and Ives. She was sent here by her company, Pearson and Ives, and she has a connection, a familial connection, to the Flanagans. Okay. Source of strength. What is her source of strength? 
source of strength is what again? It is which it, they draw. Uh, this is actually no. I I sort of skipped one because it actually says let's do personality trait first according to these rules. Or well, the document. Okay, actually, let's do the source of strength first, and then let's do the personality trait. So the source of strength is something that anchors her. It's something that keeps her grounded and forces them to continue against all odds. Um, could be rationality or optimism. Could be something external like religion or family. Um, it specifically calls out that it could be an item, a relationship, or a trait. Well, it sounds like family is an odd situation, so probably not that. Um, mm -hmm. I'm thinking about... Hmm. Source of strength. I'm thinking about, like, something that ties into the investigative nature, too, right? Like, if she sees herself as um, a budding novelist or something, she's hoping to write down what she does in order to write a story about it. Right. So I could see her source of strength being, like, the actual, like, journal she carries with her in which she writes down everything. I was actually thinking of it as, like, a notepad, but you and I are kind of on the same page without, be, without even talking about it, so I'm good with that. What do you guys think, Brandon, Matt? Yeah, I know. I mean, I can, I can definitely see that of this is something that allows uh, her to kind of travel, her, her to go out and get inspiration and have experiences most people in her situation in the, in the 1920s wouldn't have. Um, because cool. it, the other thing I was thinking of was bringing in, like, mapping of, of maps, but that might be a little bit on the nose. I, I have no problem with, with writing uh, being kind of her source. With a notepad. What about you, Matt? Do you, do you like that? Yeah, it works. Okay. So I will write down um, her writing and her notepad and pencil. Alright, and then we give her a personality trait. Um, this is something to make sure we are all anchored when playing her. It is something that is just a very general guideline that we use to sort of say this is what she's like. Um, so what personality trait are we going to give her so we can collectively play her? could be, like, angry, or it could be... It needs to be different from her source of strength, but it could be angry, it could be sad, it could be rational, it could be cold, it could be helpful, happy, optimistic, whatever. What do you think? A word that comes to mind to me right, right off the bat is professional. Mm -hmm. Professional. Yeah, someone, someone who kind of always keeps up a, a professional demeanor, who tries to kind of be the public face. I kind of like that. Uh, what does everybody else think? Yeah. yeah. Other people. So. No, I like that. No, I like that. I mean, I was the other, my other thing was uh, maybe inquisitive or curious, so it's, which would explain why they're poking their nose <laughs> so deep, <laughs> just beyond the job, even. I, I could definitely see kind of a kind of a combination of those two factors. Yeah, I'm trying to think. I think right now. Because right, right here, I'm like her writing in her notepad is already in, in some ways about the inquisitive part of it. She okay. wants no, to that, know that's so she can write it down. So I, I like I like like sort of being on the same page with that, but I like calling out professional as like the personality trait. Um, all right, cool. So we now are going to move on to the next part of the uh, teaching guide. Do 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 do. So, we have finished setup. So I will read this out. We're nearly ready to start our story. Our first scene has to contain a strange clue that hints at the horror to come. If anyone has an idea for the first clue, don't tell us, but you can be the narrator for the first scene. At the end of each scene, we'll pass our roles, narrator, witness, and watcher, to the person on our left, so everyone gets a go at every role. So again, right now, the first scene has to contain a strange clue that hints at the horror to come. The inspiration guides, I will point out again, are fantastic for coming up with a cool idea for, like, a clue. Uh, and one thing that I will purposely point out right this second, because it's very useful to have in your heads earlier, 
as opposed to later. Um, mm -hmm. We, right now, are somewhat limited in some of the things we can do by the idea of creeping horror, okay? You, it basically means nothing can be narrated that could not be explained rationally. Clues may strain reason, especially when the weight of them is combined, but they must not be overtly supernatural. No violence against humans can be narrated, nor direct evidence of violence. A mutilated corpse, for example. First-hand accounts of blatantly supernatural things and of violence against humans should only be oblique and taken from sources whose reliability is in doubt. And no attacks on the witness, including theft, sabotage, or destruction of property. So the point is that at the moment, there's no, like, oh, yeah, the first clue is the book that is glowing faintly and has an eyeball that looks at you as you move. <laughs> um, we're not there yet. We're the creeping terror mode. So the book can be weird and unsettling, but, you know, you can still come up with a sort of BS explanation for why it is the way it is. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So does somebody have an idea for the first clue? Don't tell us what it is. Just say if you do. I think I have an idea. Great. All right. So you can be the narrator. Um, and that means the person to your left, Brandon, will become... The witness, and according to to everybody watching, there's um, we we have our own little orders to to know who's next to who. So next to Brandon is me. So I will play the witness for the first uh, scene, and then Matt and Matt, you will be the the um, blah, watchers for the first scene. All right. So I'm going to read this out loud. Um, or sorry, I apologize. According to the text, the narrator should read. Uh, their part out loud. So, uh, Brandon, actually, if you would be so kind as to pull up the piece of the uh, script to read. I believe it is okay. on the page. Yep. Here we go. Got uh, it. I think so. Tell me if I'm in the wrong one. Uh, the narrator is like the author of a book, except they don't get to control the actions of the witness. The narrator says where the scene is set, and who is there apart from the witness. They describe the world and anyone the witness meets. They say that other characters do and play them the way an actor plays a character in a movie. And the narrator should bring the watchers in by pausing often to allow them to contribute details and elaborations and asking them questions about the scene and building on their answers. Finally, they get to choose when to end the scene. Okay. The witness is the main character and is in every scene. When it's your turn to play the witness, you speak for them. Again, just like an actor in a movie. You also say what the witness is doing, but it's the narrator's job to tell you the results of your actions. The narrator is always free to interrupt you and tell you the straightforward action that you're describing is going to be harder than you thought. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, you describe the witness's thoughts and feelings, especially their fears and attempts to rationalize the things they see. And so to quickly call it out, one of the techniques that it, it describes in the text is if I hold a hand up, or if anybody who's playing the witness holds a hand up, it's a signal that t you are now hearing the thoughts and feelings of the witness. And, and so pay attention, because it's like classic for these stories. Um, all right. And the watcher, go for it. Everyone else plays the Watchers. The Watchers support the narrator in a number of ways. Lovecraft's stories are full of rich, detailed, creepy descriptions. Watchers bring every scene to life by adding sensory descriptions and elaborating on what the narrator describes. They won't ever take over the scene, introduce clues, or do anything that would change the direction of the story, but they will try to intensify and heighten what the narrator says. In addition, when the narrator asks us questions, they provide an answer. They should respond with the first thing that comes to mind, never overthinking their contributions. Finally, if the witness ends up in a conversation with several characters at once, to avoid the narrator having to talk to themselves, they can also ask watchers to step in and play secondary characters. And pass the teaching guide to the narrator, and then they read this out. <laughs> okay. All right. <clears throat> During the first two parts of the game, scenes are focused on revealing clues. During every scene, the narrator has to reveal at least one clue. Clues are the signs that something sinister is going on. Anything that reveals new information about the horror or sheds new light on, its, it, on it is a clue. 
Clues can be anything from an eerie noise or inhuman-looking footprint to an alien artifact or terrifying vision. When we introduce a clue, we write the details down on an index card. Whatever we write on those index cards will be used to weave the final horror at the end of the game. We can add in bits of atmospheric detail without making them clues, but nothing really weird. And we can reuse old clues without it counting as a new clue, as long as by doing so we don't reveal anything new. I think this one hops to Brenton. It does. Lovecraft's stories are slow building, and until the very end, low-key and leaving room for doubt as to what is going on. Everything we narrate must be possible to explain rationally, even if it strains reason a little. We can't introduce tangible evidence of the supernatural, and we're encouraged to leave plenty of room for doubt. We should also refrain from narrating direct evidence of violence against humans or any kind of attack on the witness. First-hand accounts of any of these things should always be from unreliable sources, always subject to doubt. Even so, clues should always be intriguing, baffling, or scary, not something you could easily forget or dismiss. However, each of us gets to play one special card that allows us to break these limitations or go beyond our normal rules. Whenever a card contradicts the rules, the card wins. Some cards have an instant effect and are then discarded. Others are permanent. You play them, and then anyone can use the special effects on the card. You get to draw two cards, but you can only play one of them in a two-player game. You get three and play two of them. Uh, your cards will tell you when you can use them and what they do, so watch for opportunities to use them. Okay. Okay. After Oh, okay. What, what, right, so, so the first thing is good. Yep, not a problem. So um, we have dealt out one card to each person already, and actually uh, we can quickly do a second card, but I can do that in the background within our documents, and I will do my best to not actually read the cards because you should be generally surprised by them, but I will do it quickly here because I printed out all the cards, so I have a little deck, and I will just copy and paste in the text for each of us to use on our given cards. Um, now, one thing to call out is that, for the moment, we are still in part one, which is all about the clues, and, and um, every scene must have a clue which hints at the horror but can be rationalized away. Um, there are five scenes in part one, so I also think it's worth calling out that these scenes don't have to go on for terribly long. They don't have to be forever scenes. They go on for as long as makes sense and until the narrator decides to end them and say you found the clue. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right. So I'm going to make this part one place, and I'm going to say five scenes, and uh, then this is all you, Brandon. You are the narrator. You know what clue you had in mind, and so you get to set the scene um, and shape the horror through evocative and intriguing contributions. You introduce the scene, you'll eventually make sure that a clue is introduced, describe the environment and characters other than the witness, adjudicate any conflicts, and decide when the scene is over. Okay. So where are we? So where you are is um, you're standing outside the train station of uh, the town. Right outside the Pilot Point Railway Station. Yeah, Pilot Point Railway Station. Um, it's very early in the morning. Uh, it's kind of in that sort of dawn period of time where it's not quite light out yet. There's a sort of uh, fog rising up from the ocean, and the train is not did not linger long when it dropped you off here. And you had the feeling that they really felt they had better places to be. Um, you were sent here by your company. Um, the only contact that you have, uh, there's no branch of the company here. Um, what they have advised you to do is to either meet with the, the mayor of the town um, or, more helpfully, with um, a one John Peter uh, Tuhi, uh, who is sort of the intellectual center of the town. He's, he's sort of their record keeper. He's also their only, he's their reporter. He is their teacher. Um, he's the librarian. He 
sort of fulfills all of those roles because there really isn't a high demand for high enough demand for any one of them. Um, so awesome. you know, yeah, both men can be found in the same building, um, which is on Main Street, which is also the only street. <laughs> which is also the only street. And so for the two watchers, your role is to also add atmosphere to the scene, add details, elaborate on the narrator's descriptions, provide detailed texture and atmosphere, and answer any questions that the narrator asks you. So mm -hmm. if the narrator wants to ask you a question, they can, and you will then provide that answer. And you also play any NPCs if the narrator chooses for you to do so. Okay. So, uh, yes, Alice, um, Alice travels fairly lightly, I think, because she travels a lot for her job, we sort of described. Um, so she just has her single case of clothes, um, and she has her bag over her arm, um, which in which she holds her, her notepad. Um, I even think that, like, Alice is the kind to scandalously and um, terrifyingly, to a lot of people, wear pants... Um, and because it's it's easier and she's annoyed and she has to go walk over all kinds of, like, territory and land to um, do her job, and so she just wears pants. Um, it's simpler. And so she's um, standing uh, on the railway station, like, looking over the town, taking in this dilapidated place, um, and then... She steps off the platform and starts walking in to go find. Um, well, at the moment, I think she's she find she goes to find John Peter uh, Tuhi, right? Um, right. She goes to find him first because I think um, before she talks to the mayor, she wants to get um, an idea of the people of the town before speaking or dealing with an authority figure. Somebody mm -hmm. who's unlikely, who's going to be like, this town is the greatest. We would really love your company's money to be poured into this town. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so she steps into uh, Main Street and she's looking for any sign of John Peter Tui and uh, looking around at different signs carrying her bag. The first uh, it's... thing that... The, I'm sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. If I could interject. The first thing that hits you, of course is the smell. It smells like the ocean here. And fish. Mm. Rotting fish. Um, you also, she might be aware of the fact that in the distance, in the fog, she can see that there's a lot more motion than would normally be expected for this time of day. Um, but it's all concentrated around the docks, which are a little bit separated from the town. The street itself is virtually empty. Um, it's very easy for her to identify, you know, you identify very easily where uh, Tuhi likely is. Um, most, none of the buildings are larger than two stories, and there's only one down the, at the end of the road uh, that has a light on, um, that sort of glows in the mist because there is nothing else uh, really alight. Uh, there's no street lamps, no nothing. As you approach closer down the street, um, you see that this building is a bit better cared for than the others. All are obviously very salt-worn. Uh, the paint is scraped off. They're very they're dulled. Um, a lot of them do not have large windows. Uh, this one does. Uh, it has sort of a large glass window at the front next to the door with the words, you know, town hall written across it. Um, and as you, you know, when you approach, you step up and, you know, the, the porch, is, you know, there's a porch there that's kind of creaking under your steps, and, you know, a l large oaken door that when you open and step inside, you can see that this is sort of the, the, the whole first floor is just kind of an open space, uh, probably where they, the, the community comes when they want to debate an issue. Um, there are chairs stacked to the side, very worn rug. There's nothing like a reception desk or anything. And the door, notably, is unlocked. Um, whether that's because you are expected or because, simply put, no one feels there's anything worth locking in, uh, you don't know yet. But... Uh, as you as you walk in, you can kind of see the light you saw was from 
the floor above, and there is a kind of you know staircase at the back that's in decent shape. It's not like a rickety staircase. It doesn't look like it's going to collapse under you. Um, it's clear that that most of the money invested in this town has gone into this this building. So I'm I'm stepping into the building and I'm calling out um, for anybody. Hello, is anybody in the building? I'm looking for Mr. John Peter Tuhi, and I'm heading for the stairs uh, as I call out. Uh, I'm unnerved, like I, I'm unnerved and and a little bit. Um, I don't think I like this large empty open space. Um, it's almost like even though I know that it is a place where the town would gather. Right now it feels like it's full of ghosts almost, but um, I, I keep that largely within myself because I'm professional and my face is this focused mask of, I got business to do. Um, the rug is worn and stained underneath your feet. You're not even so sure what kind of stains. It's, it's too worn away to tell. And initially, as you call out, there is no response. Um, but as you get closer to the stairs, you then you, you hear something upstairs. Upstairs, You hear kind of the creak of someone getting out of a chair um, and the soft sounds of footsteps on a carpeted floor in a building that was not really well insulated. You know, this is, this is an old building in the style that, you know, you can hear kind of everyone who's there. Mm -hmm. um, as you come to the stairs, you, you hear a voice call down. Ah, this uh, and this way. Put all the names there. Ah, Miss Eckhart, is is that you? Yes, it is I. Uh, who is who am I speaking to? Oh, oh, forgive me, forgive me. Uh, my name. Uh, I am I am Mr. Tuhi. I I sent the telegram to your office uh, in down in Seattle. Please, please, come, come upstairs. And Mr. Tui is a very skinny man wearing a uh, very proper suit that has seen much, much better days. Um, <laughs> you can see where the elbows were. He has, like, the patch, so it sort of looks professional, but at the edges you can see where it's actually, like, a patch to the suit itself. <laughs> nice. Yeah, so unimpressed, right, as I'm coming up the stairs and uh, just carrying my bag, I give him that look. Uh, Mr. Tui, and I extend my hand. Ah, yes, yes. He sort of reaches out a, a little too eagerly to, to shake your hand. Um, and beyond him, because he is not a large man, you get uh, you get to see the upstairs of this building. It's one long hallway with about five rooms going off on either side. Uh, the one he was in was the one closest to the stairs, and opposite him is another door which has a name across it, which you know from your briefing was the name of the mayor, uh, Donald Stewart. It is not currently occupied. Um, the room he is standing in front of, uh, with the door open, it looks to be the town library. Um, you cannot see what the other rooms are at quite yet, um, and he quickly ushers you in to the room. Um, the room itself, it looks like basically where every book that was brought by the by any miners or settlers or whatever they happen to bring with them. Uh, there's no real organizational system. It's not a particularly large room. Um, the shelves themselves are very haphazard. It looks like sort of whatever the community donated to them. Uh, they line the four walls, and then in the center there's a rather large table with a mixed assortment of chairs, including a rather large and cushy easy chair, which you gather was the one he was working in, because there are a number of books and papers opened up on top of the table. He proceeds to step back and, and gesture to you um, to sit in that chair, as it is the nicest chair in the room. Says, please, please, ha have a seat, have a seat. I do. Uh, he pulls out his own, which is a much less, uh, less comfortable looking uh, wooden chair, that wooden kind of Looks looks like a rocking chair that had the sort of the the rocking part taken out, and so it would be a bit more stable. Nice. Um, yeah, so I wait for him to get situated before I start in on it, um, like in all business, right? Mm -hmm. uh, go a little, little quick, open my bag, pull out the sheet of paper on which his message to Seattle was written, the telegram, and uh, um, 
Mr. Tui, you signaled to us, Pearson and Ives, that um, there was something of value in this town, uh, perhaps a resource that we would be interested in marking uh, that would bring our business into this town um, that we should have someone investigate. Uh, I would like to hear from you post-haste more about this resource, considering how vague you were in the telegram. Um, I would very much hope that it's not something unimportant and, shall we say, um, snake oil worthy. Oh no no! Of course, of course not. Of course not. I would not. I would not have someone of your station, uh, uh, a, a lady of, of your station, brought up here for for no reason at all. Uh, I understand that we are we are a bit far from the uh, the big world of, of Seattle. Um, no, what I have uh, is, is is twofold. Uh, one that can bring profit, and and one that can of of monetary means, and one that can bring profit of mind. Uh, and I feel that. The, the evidence is there that these are these two things are, are interconnected. Um, now, as as you know, our our little town was first established looking for for gold, uh, much as m many settlers in our our lovely territory are. Uh, however, the the gold itself uh, very quickly drew, dried up, and many uh, looking to get rich quick did not have the patience to look for any other other treasures that could be found here. However. Uh, we do have a, a, sm a small young youth population, uh, very very curious and gifted sorts, uh, who are very curious, and they have pursued what the adults have abandoned. Um, and I feel that they may have found something that you would be very interested in. Um, he starts kind of patting at his jacket and then um, pulls out a very a, a worn map. Uh, and this is not like a, a geographically printed map. This looks like something someone drew uh, by, by hand. Uh, and he sort of unfolds it. Um, it's very worn. There's a stain that's probably, you hope to God, is coffee. Um, <laughs> and as he lays that out there, and you see that it's sort of a, a kind of a crude drawing of the town and the surrounding areas with a spot in the distance marked down. Um, and this it's to that spot that he points this. Now, one of our youngsters, a, a precocious young man by the name of James, uh, was, was going out with his father hunting, uh, and he, he ended up getting separated, and he found a, a cave network. Now, this cave network, we, we did know about. It was, uh, it was in the initial surveys, but there was no funding or interest into really exploring it. But you, you know, the, you know the, the wildness of youth. Uh, he decided to take it upon himself, and he discovered um, something, something very strange in there. Uh, first, he discovered a strange uh, black pool. Now, have have you been? I, I don't. I know a lady such as yourself is probably uh, kept kept current on on the events of the world. Although I should hope that you have not been forced to pay too much attention to the, the miserable news coming out of Europe over these past few years. I am well aware of what goes on in the world, Mr. Tui. You need not inform me. Ah, excellent, excellent. Well then, you would be you are aware too then that that many of the recent technological wonders and horrors that have been coming out uh, are involving less and less the substance of coal, but more a new, a new substance, a new valuable resource. Uh, I am speaking, of course, of, of oil. Indeed. You are suggesting to me that a child happened to stumble upon a pool of oil in an abandoned cave network here in Pilot Point. Well, I mean, I've, of course, I would not expect uh, you to just believe that. But uh, here, um, he kind of stands up nervously and goes over to a uh, desk that's kind of wedged in between two of the shelves and rattles with it for a second. It's clearly stuck, kind of a banging, and just kind of pulls it open uh, and rips around. He pulls out a small, sort of glass. Or uh, yeah, it's small small glass vial, um, the sort that you kind of find at a uh, uh, you'd probably find in a kitchen holding spices or something, um, and inside of it is what looks to be black liquid. Um, now 
you yourself aren't that familiar with oil, you haven't really right. handled it or anything. Um, so from your uneducated perspective, it looks like oil. This, uh, this is what uh, he brought back, brought back with him. So I, I take it out of his hand, right? Um, and I hold it up, and you know, I, I yeah, you're absolutely right. Like I don't know oil at all. I don't really know its properties. I don't know what it should look like. I don't know its viscosity. Um, but I sort of shake it in front of my face, and it's that impassive professional look. Like I know exactly what I'm doing, and um, I'm like, hmm. I'll have to see the entire pool to come to the full conclusion. This could simply be a small sample or, or a trick of some kind. Perhaps the child found only the smallest spurt. Of, of course, of course. I mean, uh, that's why we, why we call or contacted your company. We telegraphed them um, looking for, for an expert. Um, now, I take it I, ha I may have ha at least have your, your interest now. You do. Mr. Tui. Excellent. Well then, uh, I believe I had mentioned that there are two potential sources for wealth. One for, for monetary, but also for knowledge. Uh, and I understand that you are, you are a lady of, of business, and thus the, the interests of your company must come first. But there is something else that was discovered. And that is? Well, you see, as, as part of our lessons, I have um, been teaching the children about the the local native peoples who lived here and um, before before our own um, town displaced them. And one of our activities we have been engaging in is the creation of of rubbings to record uh, findings of of an archaeological nature. Well, as as it turns out, James uh, was paying attention in class that day. Uh, he was a good good boy, and he near the pool. Found and he's kind of again reaching around in his jacket for a different pocket. Um, you kind of find yourself wondering how many pockets a man could possibly need. And he pulls out a second a piece of um, cloth. Uh, looks like uh, sort of a, I mean it looks like a handkerchief, um, but he unfurls it and there looks to be a charcoal rubbing um, of some sort of pictographs or something. They, they look like. They, they look like crude drawings, um, but mm. they spark a memory of in the distant past of some uh, of a you know grammar school lesson on the ancient Egyptians. <laughs> hmm. Well, this is intriguing. Assuming again that it is actually. True and real. You did say that this was a precocious youngster, if I recall, and it would not be past any child to, of course, invent such drawings simply for the attention it would garner. Especially because some of those pictographs resemble people, and some of them look very strange. Mm. Well, yes, of course, that is that is always a, a possibility. But he is. Uh, you know, his his father is one of the the upstanding pillars of our community. He sort of speaks for the local fishermen, and James takes his responsibilities as a scout very very seriously. And if this is true, now I will point out that we do not have much in the way of records of the you know the the, the local inhabitants. Um, but what we do know of of some tribes did have a written lang do have a written language, and this does not resemble any one that we currently have record of. You probably at this moment might pause and look across the, again, rather small library and you know, wonder about the extent of their records. Well, the intellectual gains might be valuable, but Pearson and Ives is much more likely to be interested in the presence of oil than it is in the discovery of some old language which none can translate. However, I will investigate both of these when I go out to the caves. I'm assuming I shall do that soon, if not today, then on the morrow. Of, of course, of course. Well, I mean, I imagine you will want to rest from your arduous journey, but um, I, I will admit that there are uh, several towns. I've broached the, the topic with several townsfolk, and there are some who have volunteered to to guide you uh, when when 
you have recovered from, from your arduous your arduous travels. Well, I appreciate such offers, and I will take advantage of them after I have, as you say, recovered. Sort of with that like little snigger of like, yeah, like I need to recover. Like I do this all the time. And and you get the sense that it flies completely over his head. Yeah. Yes. Well, um, would you uh, would would you like to uh, to to rest from from your journey? Sure, I would appreciate such courtesy. Oh, of course, of course. Now we um, we do not have anything like a, a hotel of such, but um, we do have some some space. You get the sense he almost said storage uh, above the the local tavern that uh, that we sometimes set aside for for guests. Uh, that will do. That will do. Ah, uh, uh, yeah, excellent, excellent. Um, uh, I I can I will I will lead you there um, right now, right away. Um, would you Would you like to to hold on to um, to these documents or or would you like to leave them in my keeping? I I take the documents like before he even really asked that I'm already folding them up and putting them in my little bag. Ah, uh, uh, there. Very good. Well then, um, he sort of looks around as if he's sort of a habit, as as if he's expecting to have forgotten something, and then sort of shakes it off and says, "Ah, well then, um, please, please, let me let me show you to uh, to your quarters." Lead the way. Is that the end of the scene? I see that as kind of a good good transition point for, cool. for the scene. So the so the only other thing would be like the the uh, witness gets a brief moment at the end to sort of describe their fears or thoughts, especially to to bring that in. So I think that like uh, this is actually that scene. Fast forward, right? Um, it's it's a scene where after Tuhi has led her in and she's upstairs in that in that storage space and she's writing in her journal and this is what she's writing, right? Um, and she's writing like John Peter Tuhi seems like an innocent, naive, bumbling, over-eager fool of a man. He seems like that perfect combination of knowing too much and knowing nowhere near enough. I am appreciative of him drawing our attention to this town, not least that it gives me the opportunity to connect with the Flanagans. But I must say that... Besides the strange dread that comes over me merely upon looking out the window and seeing these empty buildings and this mostly lifeless expanse, I am rather underwhelmed, and at the moment am left wondering if this is truly nothing more than a wild goose chase. I am determined to find something while out here, though that my superiors at Pearson and Ives will not have cause to ridicule me when I return home. All right. So the first scene is over. After each new scene... Uh, oh, and so actually, yeah, it's worth calling out. What was the clue? What is the clue that you added? The clue that I added is the charcoal rubbing of strange pictographs. Charcoal rubbing of strange pictographs. Um, which also they looked like weird humans. Mm-hmm. Cool. Um, all right. So now, after each new scene, we can add one new trait to the witness's index card or the witness's stuff based on how they were portrayed in that scene. So what trait are we going to add to Alice Eckert? This is another thing like uh, professional. Right. I almost played her as arrogant. I almost want to add that, but yeah, yeah. well, it kind of that, that doesn't that suffer. Sense to me, actually, say it again. I think that that makes sense to me. What were uh, you gonna say, Brandon? I, I was saying the the kind of sense of like doesn't suffer what she deems to be fools lightly. Cool, cool. What about what do you think, Matt? That ass. Um, I'd say arrogant or prideful. I mean, because she's worried about her job. She doesn't want to come back and be ridiculed. So that's kind of like a point of pride, I guess. Uh, okay. So prideful, arrogant, Matt H., uh, how do you how do you think we should phrase it? Um, that's a good question. Not egotistical. No. But um, 
dismissive, almost. Oh, dismissive, because that captures what Brandon said, that doesn't suffer fool's part, and, like, she's got business to do. Um, okay. Does that work? Is everybody good with dismissive? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that works. All right, excellent. Dismissive. Okay. Uh, and now... Now it is time to consider what we think the true horror might be. We're going to be making some pretty wild guesses, especially at this early stage. But we shouldn't let this hold us back. Instead, leap to a conclusion as full-fleshed as you can and write it down in a couple of sentences. Don't show anyone else. We'll update our ideas at the end of every scene. When we're narrating, we should base our clues and other contributions to the story on these conclusions. At the end, we use them to give us a strong idea of what the final horror could be. So again, the key is right now on your page, where you know nobody, nobody should be looking at anybody else's page but their own. On your page, write down as full-fleshed of an explanation for what's going on in this town as possible. Uh, and that means it, totally wild and crazy, leap to conclusions, uh, but basically try to explain what the story is right now. And and we will refer to this moving forward. Okay? Everybody got that? All right. I'm going to do the same and mute myself so that I don't click any clack. Who keeps deleting my page breaks, you bastard? I do it by mistake because I was trying to put a new line in there. It's like, oh, it just went down. You monster. Oh, <laughs> Wait, I'm on the wrong page now. <sighs> I don't know where I am. Okay. Wait. <laughs> page four. But my page... Well, that's page three, then. What? I'm page three. There is a blank page after page... I, I should be actually, things got moved down because we wrote more at the top. So I should be page four. Uh, then next up should be Matt S. with page five or six. I'm page five. Um, Matt H., you should be page seven now. Okay. Uh, and Brandon, you should be page eight. You should be the last, Brandon. Things get moved because we added more at the beginning. Well, no, I understand, but you took away my power. <laughs> you took away the original one that was there. <laughs> Oh, did I? Okay. I, I, I have it. I mean, I, I copied it out because okay, I don't like working in Google Docs. But <laughs> okay, so there's a blank page between us. Okay, so there's that one. All right, so, okay. Okay. Great. Okay. So we should all have our own theories, and if you're still going, this is fine. All right. Um, so now we would rotate, and I believe you always rotate to the left. Um, to make absolutely sure, I'm going to quickly check, but it should be that I then become the next narrator. Uh, my left becomes the next witness, so that would be Matt S. And then Brandon and Matt H., you would continue to be the watchers. Um, okay. Yep. All right, and that is our first scene. Person to the narrator's left. Yes, and... Blah, blah, blah. I'm just checking to make absolutely sure about this when we end a scene. Also, I've checked Google Maps, and we may be actually be overestimating how not desolate this place is. <laughs> you might be giving it too much credit. Maybe overestimating. Oh, uh, that's funny. Well, I mean, again, we're talking about 1920. It's as desolate as we want it to be. We're in a hellscape. All right. All right. Pretty much looks like a hellscape now. 
<laughs> All right, so I will do narrator then. Brandon, or sorry, uh, Matt S., you were the witness. Brandon and Matt, you are the watchers. Okay. So now I should be basing my clue based off of what I just, like, my leapt to conclusions about, what I, I think it should be. Um, I, I'm attempting to essentially add a clue that in some ways points at that, but keeping in mind my clue can't be overt, it can't be, like... And that's when you find the alien body. <laughs> um, right? It can't be anything weird like that. Yeah. All right. Um, so, I think that, um, I mean, let's let's just go straight to it, right? Like, so it is a little bit later. Um, I think probably actually the following day. Like, right at the same early morning time, mist still out over the land, uh, draping it in this um, soupy, foggy weirdness that smells of the ocean, and um, walking out across um, the the empty, barren expanse itself, we, we um, see Alice Eckhart, um, but she's being led by uh, another man... Um, Let's see. Let's give him a name. Um, Ogden Colesbury. Um, and uh, Ogden Colesbury is is one of the fishermen here, and he's like um, he has a slight limp and like a uh, scar over one eye, so it's all dead and and strange and yellow. Um, as he leads her across this barren expanse through the fog towards the caves. Um, and it's that thing where, where as they go, right, there are those moments where um, she loses sight of Ogden and then she has to call out for him and his cracked voice comes back for her, uh, beckoning her onward. Um, and uh, now they are walking, like, close together, um, with the faintest signs of the the caves, which go into sort of a the, the taller hill or mountain, um, rising up over the fog, um, they're stepping closer, and and he he leans over to her as they're now walking side by side, um, and he says, "So what exactly are you hoping to find in there?" Um, okay. So what was the guy's name again? Just Ogden Colesbury. Ogden Colesbury. Alright, uh... Well, Mr. Goldsbury, that's between me and, uh, company. Um, hopefully something that will draw some new blood into this town. Um, from what I've seen so far, it's... Not much to recommend itself, uh... He, he spits when he says new blood. And there's a faint look of twist on her to her lips as she's like, oh. And of course when he's like, because he, he pr presumably turns his head and looks at her when he's speaking, or, I mean... Yes. Or, okay, I mean, you can almost, I can almost see her backing off a little bit as walking is like, I almost want to see, like, the inner monologue is like, ah, didn't he brush his teeth this morning? I mean, uh, or did did he wake up and eat a dead animal this morning? God, I'm not. In the <laughs> You're not from here, and you don't know how this place is. You don't know the lay of the land. You don't know the touch of the sea. So I can understand your ignorance, but this town doesn't need a new blood, no matter what that fool Tui says. Uh she. T looks over her shoulder and is like, if you say so, um, I'd say I'd give this place four or five years tops. I mean, the way it looks now. <laughs> uh, ye of little faith. What creepy object does he pull out of his, like, fisherman's coat and start playing with in his gnarled hands? What creepy object is that, Matt? Oh, Matt, Matt H., yeah. He has an old scrimshaw pipe that he clings to. What but, What does the pipe look like? What is, What is on it? Or can she? Maybe she can't even see. Actually. Yeah, I think that that's fair. But I was. I would also suggest that it is 
it's not quite the right color. Mm. You've seen scrimshaw work before, and it's it you you recognize it as an object de art, but it is not uh, doesn't look right to you. Mm-hmm. So tell me, Mr. Coles Colesbury, how long have you been, lived in this town? Long enough. Many a year came out with the first rush. Was surprisingly young then. The years they take and they take and they take. Oh, so you know the Flanagans or whoever owned the old Flanagan house saw that from the train station. He pauses for a second and then he turns slowly and gives you that one-eyed look and do. What's your interest in the Flanagans? Well, it never hurts to know the people in the town, or if they're still a factor in the town. Indeed. Let me tell you something. The Flanagans, they keep to themselves, and they aren't to be messed with. You would do best not to inquire after them. In fact, you'd do best to leave Pilot Point quick as you can, but doesn't seem like you're the type of woman who takes sound advice. Well, if I took sound advice, I'd probably be listening to my mother and been married off by now. <laughs> yeah, you, you get the sense that he's not got the highest opinion of willful women. Nope. <laughs> he's a bad man. Well, I, think, I mean, it's unfortunately, I mean, our company, I mean, looks like the Flanagans have a very large grasp of this town from the what little documentation I've been able to acquire about it. So, I mean, sooner or later I'll have to deal with them, so I just try to get a feel for them. Plus, we have to talk about something, otherwise this is a quite a long trek to this cave system. Yes, and it should be louder. There should be animals. There should be noises. But there's nothing. Just you two slogging along in the quiet. Although perhaps that's also because you are someone who's spent a lot of your time in cities and you find yourself uncomfortable tripping over things that Ogden just naturally avoids, sort of making more noise than you realize, not, not really feeling in your element here. And that's, like, just as you're unnerved, that's when um, there's a yelp, a sudden sharp yelp, um, like a, a loud noise, almost inhuman, strange and animal. And and suddenly um, the body of, like, a, a, an older teenaged uh, boy comes hurtling out from from you don't even really know where there's not many places to hide in this in this barren expanse on the way to the caves so it's not even clear where he could have come from but he just he leaps out uh, with that screaming he's completely naked and covered in a mix of like mud and and strange clay and uh, black smudges on his body uh, wild eyed and his hair is longish and matted um, and and he he leaps out, and then he starts running straight towards Alice when Ogden gets in the way, and he says, "Tommy, damn it, Tommy!" And he starts. He grabs the boy by the shoulder and pushes him backward. Um, I can almost see Alice like stifling a shriek, not quite a shriek, but like like a. Yes. Barest of a hiccup comes out, and it's like, um, yeah, I can almost see her like she has her, not 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 a purse, not for the wilderness, but like a uh, sack, like mm-hmm. knapsack type thing that's sort of slung over the shoulder, and it's like you can, I will see her reaching into it, like, and you can hear like the faint click of a gun being cocked as as she ducks behind. I mean, even as Tommy or Tommy's running at her and she's kind of it's like she's almost starting to move behind Ogan as he moves in front of her. I mean, so he's like mm-hmm. 
He's like, uh, Ogden is totally focused on Tommy and pushing him backward, and then eventually Ogden just rears back one gnarled hand and punches Tommy across the face, and Tommy goes flying away. Like, you see the blood flex spill out of his mouth, and then um, Tommy, like, whimpers a little bit and then looks up at you and looks up at Ogden, uh, whimpering a little bit again, moving strange and like an animal. Um, and, and Ogden th- looks down at him and then back at you and says... You can find your way yourself. The caves are over in that direction. Just keep going straight and don't deviate. You'll get there fine. I'll be back there as soon as I can to lead you back to town. I've got to take Tommy home. Does Tommy have some kind of development? Well, what would they call it back then? Illness, malady. Touch the head. Mal- yeah, touch. <laughs> he's a bit touched in the head. Uh, it's not often that I see folks running around in their natural state. I mean, Except for the... Tommy's got a bit of the black man. It's not, not a real... Nothing to worry about. Just pilot point for you. The black madness. That's Don't worry be... about it. With any luck, you won't be here long enough that it will matter. At, at this point, Alice gets the sense that Ogden's really kind of just dismissed her. He's actually actively turned away from her to gather up the boy using that kind of rough fisherman manner that he's not like you're not coddling this this kid yeah. he's grabbing him and like wrenching him yeah. but he's he's also like the whole time he's wrenching him around it but he's also doing this like wry come along mr tommy come along let's get you home your parents must be missing you and there's this last second where Tommy reaches over his shoulder and he looks back at Alice and his blubbering lips it's like they shape a word like he's trying to communicate it to Alice, like he's trying to say something, but it doesn't quite form, and then he gets yanked into the fog by Ogden. All right. Any last thoughts from Alice before we end the scene? Um. Okay, so... I'd say this... I mean, she's looking direction that Ogden indicated the case we're in. She's looking back at where Ogden and Tommy walked off. And it's like, I can almost see her in her head. like, Tommy who, though? He never said his last name, which is kind of weird. Because most old folks like to call people by both their names when they're in trouble. (laughs) Um, And I can see, like, a hint of, like, she... She's almost tempted to go back and follow them just because she doesn't like being out here alone because, like, watching the two of them walk off into the fog and then it's, like, the fog and it's, like, as soon as their steps kind of die away, it's, like, it's really quiet here (laughs) and it's starting to freak her out a little bit. But then I can see her, like, almost talk to herself trying to, like, no, you have a job to do. Let's let's get back to it. Coming off in that direction. (laughs) Ah, uh, that's great. And that ends the scene with her like trying to find the right way to go in the fog. That's perfect. Um, all right, so the clue I added um, was... I'm going to phrase this specifically as Tommy blank infected by the black madness. That's the clue. Okay? So now we do the exact same thing as last time. You are going to basically revise and or build a new theory incorporating all the clues we have so far as to what you think is going on um, and, again, leaping to a full conclusion. This is not vague. This is you attempting to come up with a final answer for what the hell is going on in this town. All right, so adjust whatever you've got already added. Um, and the, Oh, and then we'll, we'll circle back and we'll do the extra trait as well, um, which is the other thing we need to do at the end of the scene. All right, so I will revise my own...
All right. Um, so let's call out uh, what character trait would we add to Alice Eckert based on that scene? Hmm. I'm thinking like um, not frightened. That's not quite right. Um, inquisitive. Uh, something to do with dismissing Ogden. No, she had the gun. Actually, that's totally what I want to call out. On her guard. On her guard. Yeah. Yeah. I like that because that that's actually a great one to have. That like. When shit goes down, she goes for the gun. Um, doesn't mean it'll work, but she does. Yeah, she uh, probably has a gun. All right. Let us continue then. So, I just finished being the narrator. That means Matt S., you are now the narrator. And it means who is to the left of Matt S., Matt H., you are now the witness. So, Matt H., you're the witness. Matt S., you're the narrator. Brandon, you and I are the watchers. All right. Okay, um, so let's pick up where we kind of left off in the last scene. So um, Alice has been stumbling around in the fog. Um, she um, Basically, she stumbles out into the edge. Um, all of a sudden, she stumbles out of the fog into the edge of this very threadbare hedge, um, kind of like a... Uh, about five foot tall. It's yeah, it's just a giant overgrown hedge. I mean, basically, it's she's like she's come out of the woods, and all of a sudden she's faced with this giant hedge. Um, hmm. Looking, I mean, she looks both directions. She sees it off. There's looks like there's some gaps in it, but I mean, right, like there's a good six foot section that's contingu contiguous, and then like off to the right, there's a looks like there's a break into it, and off to the left, there's probably another break, several breaks, and a couple. There's a couple also brown bushes and whatnot. Um, and I think that something tells her that this this doesn't seem right, but she's not. She doesn't know anything about the nature of this place or the the plant life, and so it, it gives her a, a disquieting feeling like this doesn't belong. But she has no rational reason for why it wouldn't belong. She doesn't know why it wouldn't belong. Hmm. It's too much to hope that this would be marked on the map, if there was a map, which would have been helpful at this point. No, no, keep going in this direction. That'll be good. <laughs> well, I mean, we can. I mean, she definitely have the map. She, I mean, no, i It's probably close to useless, of course, because you cave on the edge of town. Mm -hmm. Um. All right. Well. It's not like I haven't gone wandering in the woods before. Let's, or by strange hedges, I suppose. Let's go look towards one of the breaks in the hedge. Uh, I mean, so I mean, basically, she makes her way. Um, and coming to the break, she is she's stumbled upon a very large house. Um, so evidently, she has gotten herself lost, and she has ended up <laughs> nowhere near where the caves happen to be. But, um. It's a very old-looking house. Um, this is, yes. Walk around in the fog. You get lost. Okay. Well, perhaps they're aware of some. Um, you never know. All right. Steal myself. Square my shoulders. Walk up to the house and knock on the door. Uh, does someone want to give me a description? Like, there's a face peering out from the uh, from one of the larger picture windows with the sure. dilapidated curtains. Sure. There's uh, it's a it's a long face, um, and it's sunken and yellow even through. And the windows, um, like the glass is not good. This is not clear, uh, uh, solid glass. This is like the warped glass that leads to uh, strange distortions of the face on the other side. So it looks oddly inhuman and distorted, but uh, it's long and like even even through the window you can tell these eyes are dark and there's dark circles underneath and they look like uh, cold and and uh, uh, like the faintest bit of light coming from within them, but but ultimately almost just completely black, overshadowed by the brow. Um, 
of this strange face, which for, looks feminine, framed by scraggly hair, scraggly black hair. And that's who you see peering out the uh, side window at you as you walk up to the this, the back porch, which is a very uh, old back porch. Uh, there's some boards missing here and there. I mean, it looks like when it was new, it would have been like a really impressive porch, but now it's been a few years, and it doesn't look like it gets a lot of traffic. Um, there's an old brass knocker. Of course. Okay, that was old scarred, I imagined, but knock, knock. Um, okay, so basically there's a... Um, you can hear the echo of the knock throughout the house, and you hear this uh, creaky old voice. Yes, who is it? What do you want? Why are you trespassing? Um, I apologize. I lost my way. I was being... Um, I was receiving directions from uh, one of the local gentlemen, Ogden someone or other. I seem to have forgotten his last name. That's unfortunate. Uh, regardless, I was looking for a nearby cave entrance, and I happened upon your property in the fog instead. I was hoping you could point me in the right direction, or failing that, point me back in the direction of town. Um, you hear some creaking on the other side as the door slowly opens, and this the face that you saw before in the window is looking at you. Um, it's a... Let's go with the uh, Brant. Uh, guess both Brendan, Brandon. <laughs> Get the A in there. Um, what does this person look like? So, uh, this person is besides long face. <laughs> so, so they have the long face, uh, but they they are they are old, but they're the kind of old where you really can't tell for sure whether it's age, environment, or poor living that's resulted in, in, in them. Like, they don't... They're not, like, a wrinkled little person. Um, they look kind of weathered. Um, but they carry themselves with a, a sort of disdainful dignity, kind of, kind of an old-world nobility-type attitude of... There, you're you are putting upon them just by being near them, um, and absolute confidence in their domain that this is this is their world. Um, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of appearance, uh, sort of a, a definitely a gray thinning hair, sort of a almost gaunt appearance, um, sort of not quite skeletal, but give it a few years, and you'll be getting there. Um, you know, the, the clothing is clearly 20, 30 years out of date, and it doesn't look like they've really been updating it, and, you know, which makes sense. There's, there's no general, you know, there's a general store in town, but you didn't see a, a, a department store or anything like that. These, these may very well be the clothes they have worn for the last 30 years, just kind of constantly washing, and they look faded. Um... Yeah, uh, and the, the way they look, again, they look at you kind of, again, just, just you are an intruder in their domain, and they have very little interest in you. I'm wearing an exaggerated smile, as is best to deal with some people like this. Uh, I apologize for intruding on your privacy, madam, absolutely, but if... You could point me in the right direction. I will be out of your hair as soon as possible. Truly, I did not mean to intrude. Well, it's good that you have some manners. It's don't often meet some that have manners. Either they come barging in, or you get the Tommy foe who comes running through the corners of the property like a little mad person. Um... But caves. You can't go in the caves. Caves belong to the Flanagans. I, I, I see. All the caves belong to the Flanagans? 
I, I see this person leaning out over the edge of the doorstep and like uh, raising an arms like, all this hill back here belongs to the Flanagans, or most of it. Maybe not that one over there, but all deeded. I mean, I can show you if you really need it. Um, heard there's some new per. Oh, you're the new person in town, aren't you? Come here with that fancy uh, city company and looking to reinvest or something. Well, we may be interested in investing in the local town, depending on if there are things in the town that are worth investing in, I suppose. You, you get the sense that she's looking at you sort of like a, like a cat. Not, not necessarily a cat, but the, the sort of look you see with you know, a large, a larger predatory cat of sizing you up, of deciding whether you have something of worth, something you're you're something to be devoured, or you're something to be dismissed. Hmm. Well, in that case, I should probably offer you some tea and have you come in. Uh... That tea would be lovely, madam. Although you. You could just point me on my way. I don't mean to intrude, to be sure. Oh, you're a lawbreaker, then. You enjoy trespassing other people's property. Certainly not. Tea would be excellent. Grand choice, grand choice. That. Right this way. And she turns her back, and she walks in, and it's like walking into the house. Um, presumably, you are following her. <laughs> yes, I suppose um, Running, okay. which I do not have cause to do. <laughs> well, you do have cause. Uh, she stops in the kitchen. There's a, Basically, you've come into the kitchen. Um, it is an older-style kitchen. It has seen somewhat better days. It looks like it's been recently cleaned. Um, things are not totally cobwebby. Um, and you can, I, you can see her trying to uh, pause for a moment, and then she uh, waves the tray up. Uh, would you be a dear and carry that for me? I will be right down this hallway here, and to the left, that'll be the parlor, and I can show you what where the Flanagan property is, and perhaps you can tell me more about what you're looking for, and uh, perhaps it, maybe there'd be some opportunities that uh, you haven't heard of yet. I see feeling very put upon, but all right, let's pick up the tray and walk with the old woman. The tray is deceptively heavy. It looks like it might have been made of solid silver. Um, this is not something that you could have bought in town. This is something that came from, either was brought with or was directly imported. The fact mm -hmm. that you are carrying this is a statement. And you get... You, feel as if you understand it. Um, so she walks up to the parlor doors and she opens them. Um, a hint of dust. I mean, if you look closely in the corners, you'll notice there's some spider webs and whatnot. And walking into the stately room, it's the furniture is well to do. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's like... Actually, some of it still has dust covers on it, um, which are looking a little dingy. Um, but she, I mean, but there's two. There's a chair that looks out over a picture window that looks out over the front of the uh, house lawn, um, where she serves sells herself. And there's like a little table between the two chairs for you to set the tray on, <laughs> which she sort of waves her hand at um, as she settles oh. herself down. Um. Brendan, do you want to give some details about the room? Uh, hmm. Sure. Yeah, the, there's only one coming to mind, and, and I want to make sure that it's it fits. But um, I'm in, I'm seeing that like um, there are actually paintings. It's like paintings covering everything, and they're old, faded, horrible uh, paintings in strange frames that are all tarnished. And every painting is a portrait, and it's a person. 
and you can see the body of the person, you can see the neck of the person, but every single face has been totally blacked out by a black smudge of some kind. Um, and, and again, these paintings cover the walls. So there's barely any space of wall visible amid the paintings. They just cover all the walls, and every single one of them is a portrait, and every single one of them is a black smudge. Hmm. I see you aren't much for family, then. Oh, that wasn't actually done by me. That's, well, don't think it was done by me. Sometimes the memory goes as one gets older. Um, but no, it's, I know who most of them are. There's Uncle Jared and Grandpappy Joe. And she, basically, she reels off a few names as she points at them. Um, it's family, some yeah, closer than others. But That's fascinating, of course. So what are your interest in the caves? I'm curious, and I mean, people have been searching those caves for very many years. No one's really found anything in them. Uh, just if someone had, there'd be a lot of people here once again. Well, I'm not completely at liberty to discuss any potential finds that Pearson and Ives might have, might be interested in at this moment, but. Hmm. And she sips her tea watching you, like, not willing to discuss, hmm? Yes. If you're uh, kind of a... to confirm wow. any potential finds before we could even discuss. Hmm. If there's value to those finds. There was a, uh, there's mentioned potential of perhaps, um, well, let's say hypothetically oil in the vicinity. Hmm. That is, a uh, brand, brand, Brandon, you were going to say something? I was just saying that there's a, there's a sound of a clock kind of ticking away in the background. That really seems to be the only sound you're hearing. Again, is if, if there were someone else in the house, you'd probably hear them, because these old houses, you know how they creak. Mm -hmm. Oil, you say. Well, that's interesting. Uh, I haven't heard those rumors myself. I mean, it's usually it's just some old stagnant swamp water that's been left out too long, and has grown some allergy that people mistaken. Um, Sipping my tea. Just a hypothetical. No, yeah, well, it's... Well, wait here a second. I've got something you may be interested in. I mean, if you're going to be going exploring the old caves, uh, uh, did do a survey a few years back and got some accurate, well, decent maps. Better than most of what those little kids like to draw downtown. Big old spooky house for Flanagan's. Uh, I would be interested in seeing those if you wouldn't mind, of course. Well, that would be, depending on if us... Uh, Pearson and Ives be interested if they are turns out to be interested if they're going to be acquiring property but rights or not or I mean because you seem to be like willing to tr go trespassing other people's property go investigating stuff I mean it shouldn't was, you just come to the source or it was never my intention to trespass and there was no one in town who led me to believe that I would be in fact trespassing on someone's property for sure. Or else I would not have done it. It would be an illegality, unthinkable, really, to even suggest such a thing. Of course, such a properly like you should would know and would respect such things. Um, she clambers, clam, clambers to her feet, and you can hear her bones kind of creak as she does so. And it's like, 
I haven't heard much about oil, but now Native American stuff for the old natives that used to live here. There's some stories back there, but I'm not one to tell you those. Um, so she walks over to a desk, uh, um, a roller desk that's sitting. Um, actually, it's in the next room. So basically, she just walks over to the to a wall, or to a far wall set of doors, and she opens them. And it leads it to a an old study. Uh, basically, look just looking from looking from the door into it, you notice there's some cobwebs up in the upper corners of, her, of the doorway, and the room is kind of very dusty. And she walks over to a uh, she actually walks out of sight, um, and you hear the sound of a the old rolling top desks, like you hear something go, the clatter of wood and whatnot, and you hear the rifling of paper, and uh, she walks back out and pulling a thing, and uh, as she walks back into the door, she she's carrying a uh, roll of paper. It's about three feet long, rolled up, and uh, it gets tilted in a... Uh, uh, a strange, it looks like an old dagger type, old stone dagger falls out of the uh, roll of paper as she carries this set of uh, things over. And she uh, lays them out over the parlor ta table. It's like, uh, she gives the briefest of glances at the stone, and like, oh, I have to pick that up. And then, like, she's almost dismissive of it. Um, Let me help you with that. I'll go over and pick it up and set it gently on the desk. Okay, I mean, basically, take when you get a closer look at it, it's an old stone dagger. It has, a, basically, it's like an old flint knife kind of deal. Um, it has the stone nappings, and it's it looks like it's seen better days, but it's a very it's a kind of an odd shape. It's a triangular shaped head, cutting head. Um, so whoever done it was very good at what they did, and it comes to an old. Uh, broken point. So basically, it looks like at one point it was a very sharp tip, but now it's been sort of broken off. So it's kind of a uh, triangular shape with with the top broken off. Um, right but on. she sets it down and she uses uses it to hold one end of the map down. And as she spreads it out, you see a very well done overlay of what she considers to be the Flanagan property. Um, so basically, you see the house and it's like. Well, this place over here is where the caves. Like and you actually see, it was like, and you see with the it's very delineated where the Flanagan property is. And while she claimed they own the whole mountain, you see that she only owns probably good. F you weren't trespassing that far onto her property, but she mm -hmm. owns probably about 500 feet back up the side of the mountain. And mm -hmm. so you see several cave entrances that are on her property, but there's two or three that are of her property line. Um, okay. Well, this is interesting, man. I, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. Uh, that's true. Damn, I'm getting so old, I forget my manner sometimes. My name is Eleanor Flanagan. And here, and we've both forgotten our manners. You didn't introduce yourself either. <laughs> Forgive me, madam. Uh, uh, it's rudeness uh, uh, forgives okay. rudeness. Uh, it is never good to repay rudeness. <laughs> it is never good to repay rudeness with rudeness, for certain. So, you know. Cheers. Formal, yeah. <laughs> A pleasure to meet you, and... Uh... So, and yes, um, and I am noting down shorthand, of course, the approximate direction and locations of these cave entrances. Now, depending on the find, Pearson and Ives may have to come back to negotiate with you, but. That will be at least a few weeks. I will have to report my findings back to them. And that will mean leaving Pilot Point and going back to, um, let's say, Juno at the very least. 
to get a telegraph wire in. Um, once she let once she lets you note down stuff and you say that it's like, well, weeks, you you are ambitious, dearie, very ambitious. Here, let me walk you out. Um, and she leads you out to the front door, and it's like, mm -hmm. and basically you can see basically there's a uh, small road that leads, and you can actually see the fog is starting to lift a little bit, and you can see the town about a quarter of a mile up the road or through the trees. Um, but just weeks. Well, it'd be interesting. Uh, please make sure you stop by. It'd be interesting to see here if you've actually found anything up there. Always was. Always, always am interested in to hear what people think. Thank you, Miss Flanagan. And I'm sure I will be hearing from you, or perhaps you will be hearing from me soon. New as, and I am walking out the door. As you walk out the door, though, just some strange thought crosses your mind. Nothing that you really dwell upon, but that's odd. You don't really recall seeing a clock. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the end of the scene, narrator? Yes. All right. Do any any thoughts that like any thoughts from uh, Alice's mind as she goes? Or are you good? Uh, just that I will be happy to be done with this place. It has been, it, it is weighing on me a little bit, and I will be happy to get back to civilization. <laughs> it's a horrible place. All right. Uh, so let us first of all flag what what exactly would you say the clue that you added is, Matt? That odd stone knife. Odd stone knife. Okay. Um, now let's add a trait to Alice. So, what trait would we add to Alice? Hmm. Hmm. I don't know. The one that cropped up in my mind was polite, sort of. She was ex she was definitely holding to some a lot of proprieties. Mm -hmm. It seemed, even though they didn't introduce each other by name until the very end, even that was flagged as an impropriety. Mm. Um, what do you think? Yeah, I think it, it seemed like she was more comp in a strange way, even though this is kind of this weird old woman in the middle of the woods, because she is upper class, uh, Alice almost felt more comfortable dealing with her. Oh, that's a good point. She she knew how to deal with this person. This is like a savvy person who's looking looking to get some sort of advantage, and she knows how to do that. So, like, comfortable with the upper class? Yeah, or like yeah, accustomed to to, accustomed to privilege to society. Yeah, accustomed to society. What do you what do you think, Matt? Hmm. I'd have to agree. I mean, it's, um, I don't know how you'd phrase it, though. It's very polite, uh, holding to society till, well, not... I mean, we've already established, though, that she's a little bit outside of society. So it's almost just like that she knows how to play the game well enough, if that makes sense. Okay, so do you want to say, like... Um... I don't know, then the trait of chameleon, maybe? Like, she, she changes who she is to suit the situation because she was in that situation. She needed to do the proper thing, but she'll be someone different in other situations. I'm good with that. Social mm -hmm. chameleon. You go with that? I can see that. Social chameleon. All right. So now let us update our things about what's going on. Uh, or write if you want. Um... And once that's done, it will pass again. Uh, and according to my little chart, that means Matt H. will become narrator, Brandon will become witness, and myself and Matt S. will be the watchers. So quick update.
Okay. All right. So you are up with narration narrator Matt H. I am, in fact. All right. So it's been a busy morning traipsing through the wilderness by yourself as Ogden has not returned this way for some reason. But then again, he sent you in a very general direction, so it's not strange that he wouldn't know exactly where to find you. Um, however, and you can tell me if this is incorrect, but I'm assuming that you are checking the caves first off the woman's property as opposed to the ones on. Yes, I think that deliberate, very, very deliberately choose to make sure uh, that the proper protocols are, are respected and that there's no grounds that they can claim that they have uh, undue rights to this, this discovery. And of course the first cave entrance you've checked is a, one that dead ends about 100 feet in and you are glad that you brought that flashlight but prepared as you are it's not something that you would worry about too much. Um, it's on the way to the second that you are you are meandering along the path as you do. Um, when you come upon a clearing, and inside the clearing is a herd of deer, and at your entrance they all look. They they turn and they look at you, but they're not running. They're just staring at you. In fact, their eyes are just a little bit red. And one of them snorts. I, Alice sort of pauses and stares back at them for a moment and is sort of struck by the notion that these are bigger than deer are supposed to be, which, which is not necessarily actually a statement that they are. It's more of a statement that she's never seen a deer before. And she's just kind of realizing and confronting that fact. And mm. that she wonders if if really they were meant to be this big. Um, and even though they're deer, they're supposed to, you know, they're passive, you know, grazers. They're the stuff of children's stories. She, she feels like she doesn't want to get close to them. She, she sort of look, tries to figure out a way around them. The, the problem being, this is, you know, this is a path that's basically just been worn through the wilderness. This isn't a paved road. And, and almost as you're having that thought, they bound off into the woods and are gone. <sighs> silly. Ugh, super silliness. Honestly, if they could see you now, they would talk about your womanly weakness and how you're not cut out for this sort of traipsing about in the woods. Ugh, calm yourself. Gather yourself. Remember, you are a professional. And you continue on to the second cave entrance, mm -hmm. which is cut into a low hillside as opposed to the others, which clearly went down into un underneath the mountain systems. But this one's a little further out for some reason. It, if you were superstitious, and you most certainly are not, although I may be putting words in your mouth or head, they, it's almost like a barrow, you would say. Um, Brendan, give me some, some descriptions of the outside of the cave, if you would. Sure. Um, at the very mouth of it, there are signs of strange roots hanging down across the, the cave entrance, like reaching down, and they look strange as they branch out oddly like wooden splintery hands uh, hanging down from the top like they would catch your head and scrape along your hair as you tried to pass. Uh, just inside, there's the faintest dripping of some liquid. You can see the, the glint of light just inside before the light gets swallowed up by the blackness of the cave as water drips and drips and drips, some condensation collecting here from the inherently moist air out here by the ocean. And so I'm assuming you continue inside, of course, trusty flashlight in hand, roots scraping through your hair. You, you, yes, uh, it's kind of the 
You are not a child being told fairy tales, nor are you some screaming woman from some man's fantasy novel. You are not going to be chased off by shadows and wood. And sort of walks in, but at the same time, she finds one hand sort of resting in her bag as she moves deeper in under the light of the flashlight. Okay. Um, and you continue onward underneath the hill. And the passages twist and turn and sometimes become very narrow and other times widen out. But for the most part, and it does dead end a few times, you can trace a path. And it continues on for several hundred feet until it opens up. And there, in front of you, is a large black pool. This had better be a substantial find or the costs of enlarging these tunnels will be more than we'll actually make off of any, any amount of oil. This will definitely result in a serious investment. We'll have to pave roads and it's this. The, the ceiling of right. the case is smooth. It's almost as if it was carved. But that's impossible, of course. And the pool itself laps up onto the shore. It, it's almost as if it has waves, but there couldn't be from wind. You don't feel any air moving in here. It's completely still for certain. There's a, there's a sense of oddness, of wrongness about this place, and she has to, has to order her feet to move a step in, and then another, and then she stops and sort of stares at the pool for a moment, thinking to herself, I am, I am, do I even need to go near this? I'm, I'm no geologist, I'm no, no expert on, on liquids and, and such, it should be enough for me to just simply confirm this and they can can telegraph them back and have them send someone else. But, I mean, we have the sample back at the back at the back of my room. Do I need another? I mean, certainly, the boy could be playing a prank, and if they spent the money to send someone else out to this this place, I would look a fool if this were not true. So why uh, do I not wish to get closer? And the waves continue to lap on the shore as you have these thoughts. And it just continues on in that almost silence. You can hear it. You can hear it moving. But it's only when you turn to go and you kick something on the ground and reach down to pick it up. It is a small skull, oddly shaped, too long to be any kind of animal that you recognize, but yet... It, it has eye holes, it has teeth, many long and sharp ones. It must be predatory of some kind, but it, it's too, too small to be a fox, too big to be any kind of rabbit. Whatever is it? I'm, I'm not here to look at, look at old bones. And where, where, are those, where are those paintings that you mentioned those here as well. She's kind of starts looking, flashing the light around the walls, anything to not look at that pool, to not think about that strange, strange skull. And as you flash the light around, you can see, and strangely, not where the stone is smooth, where the stone is rough along the walls, you can see patches of writing. But in other places, it's, it's almost as if it has been smoothed away, whether that's time or... It's close to the entrance of this place. It's also, you can see, following the walls a little bit further out, but that would take you over the dark liquid, and it seems to be something you're very uncomfortable with for some reason. No, no, I should, I should confirm this. I mean, 
yes, there are scratches on a cave. It could be some some native sheltered here. It could be some boys drawing crude crude images. Uh, she she walks towards the wall and kneels down, shining the light on it, and kind of fumbles around her her journal, um, kind of awkwardly awkwardly opens it on her leg and pulls a of course small pencil and sort of looks at these symbols, trying to piece together, trying to make images out of the clouds and sketch a few of them down. Mm -hmm. Not not there listening are, to the sound of waves at her back. There are strangely shaped things in these these drawings. You don't care to speculate. Some of some of them look fairly close to people and as much as stick figures look fairly close to people. I mean it's pictographic. What can you really tell? all this time, but tri triangular symbols repeat throughout, and y you don't you don't have a clear sense of what's happening here. It's it's almost like there were strangely shaped things interacting with normal people. There were triangular objects involved, perhaps. No, that can't be it. I, Garbage and gibberish, really. Uh, my my mind reels away from from these symbols. They they lead down paths and puzzle like a puzzle. But the picture isn't one that my mind wants to grasp. And and she becomes quickly uncomfortable with this. And her pencil suddenly comes to a stop, as if it does not wish to capture any more. Which of course is ridiculous. It's, it's simply hysterics. And she stands suddenly, determined, angry. Angry because she does not like what she feels here. And she focuses on the tunnels, on the walls, on what she knows, on surveying, on landscapes, on profitability of, of analyzing what is the best path, what is, what is the elevation. And starts copiously taking notes as she walks towards the exit. She wants to be out, because not because she is afraid or not because of any unsettlingness, but because that is where her... her her knowledge lies. That is what she is here to do: is to to learn about about elevation, about depth, and about about widening, and what tools will be needed. And, and that is that is her focus as she starts to move toward back away from the cave. There, and as you walk in that direction, although you weren't aware that you were aware of it, this the lapping of black liquid slowly recedes from your hearing, perhaps your, your mind even, until you find yourself at, at last back out in sunlight to hear the, the voice of Ogden behind you, sitting up there on the hill, slowly carving his scrimshaw. I see you found it. Yes, I, I found my way. It was a slightly more complicated than, than simply walking straight. I, I see you had... The, is it, is it common for for men men of your of your build and your your you know skill to allow a woman to explore caves un, unescorted? Well, something tells me about a lady such as yourself. He takes a minute and blows off the piece. Would have gone and done it whether I'd offered to help you or not. Ah, well, I see that there's knowledge of women to be found on the frontier. It's just that, that that hard outdoor living wisdom that I've heard so much about. And anyway, I that there are the some of your story, some of the stories I've told are true, but it remains to be seen what actual profitability is here. Uh, please escort me back to the town. I will. I will need to speak with the uh, with the mayor. Of course, young miss. And um, I guess you'll be wanting to uh, get that first ticket out of here. Well, at least I. I'm speculating, I suppose. Mm, yes, Come well, on, then. Back to the town. Let's keep let's keep our speculations to uh, to fact, shall we? All right. I, I think that's pretty much the scene. Yep. All right. So the new clue that was added was. Um, I was calling it out as the malformed skull, mm -hmm. because I actually have the card specimen which is an ongoing effect, of revealing clear but indirect evidence of a creature unknown to science. 
So I'm actually going to take this from my page and post it up in uh, the stuff we know, basically. Yeah. So, so this is a special card that you played. The card tells you when to play it, and yours says specifically play it after... Where'd it go? Play it after a scene with a specimen, basically. Um, and... Yeah. So its effects are that uh, from now on, I think we can introduce those effects. Ongoing effects that can be used by anyone once the card has been played in the appropriate part of the game. Right. Okay, so from now on, basically, it means we can introduce... Um, where Where did you put this guy? I put it underneath additional traits. Okay. I'm looking. There it is. Okay. So we can introduce uh, in part one, reveal clear but indirect evidence of a creature unknown to science. In part two, that'll be different. We can do different things. Mm -hmm. um, okay, cool. So the uh, clue is the malformed animal skull. And what new trait are we adding to Alice? I'm almost going to say defiant. Like... I don't know, acting despite not knowing better, that's not the word that I'm looking for, but I'd almost say willful, just yeah. this is a very willful. strong will or willpower. <laughs> willful works for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, kind of dealing with that shakenness of justifying too to herself when she does she pushed herself. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I like that. All right, and now everybody update your leap to conclusions or leap to a conclusion about what's going on here. Incorporating all the clues we've got. The clues, which I will quickly go over again, are a charcoal rubbing of strange pictoglyphs, uh, Tommy Blank infected by the Black Madness, the odd stone knife, and the malformed animal skull. Okay. Okay, so next up would be uh, Brandon as narrator, me as the witness, and Matt S and Matt H as the watchers. Okay. I just type in a few things. So you are the narrator, Brandon. Yep. Mm. And this is the last round, I think, too, for part one. Yes, so part one has five scenes, and then we will enter part two. 
Uh, part two, largely it will matter for your cards, which may say something about part two and when things can be done and what happens in part two. But there's also, um, more importantly, something at the end of the first scene in part two, we will read another part of the teaching guide that tells us what happens next. So for the moment, let's just keep continuing with part one as per usual. You're up, Brandon. Yep. All right. So um, your return to the town is without incident, although not without calm. Ogden seems content that you have been suitably disturbed by what you saw and sort of has a, a more smug demeanor about him, uh, but doesn't really feel the need or will to say anything to you on the journey. When you arrive back in town, you find it much as you left it, um, largely empty, which is more disturbing in the light of day than it was in the quiet light of the early morning. Um, there are a few, one or two whim, old women by the front of the general store. Uh, it's clear that there's, you know, an employee inside, but beyond, and a young, younger woman rushing somewhere. You can't imagine where she would possibly have to rush to. But beyond that, the streets are barren and empty. Um, and it's just you and Ogden walking down under the inspecting eyes of the two crones in the general store. At your request, he has led you back to the town hall, where you find yourself once more standing before an empty building, now revealed to be a bit more sad and old by the light of day. I thank Ogden for bringing me back here. Um, he grunts like, somewhat yes. and shuffles off. Turn away from the weird old coot. And... Um, yeah, I uh, actually am going to look for the mayor, who I haven't spoken to yet. Mm -hmm. um, you can, as you cross back again through the main meeting room, still empty and sense that whatever's happened here is long over, and you missed out on what could have been going back to this. Once you reach, as you approach the staircase though, you finally start to hear some signs of life. Uh, there are clear footsteps overhead and you hear the what sounds like the voices of children. Um, as you head up the stairs, that sound grows more noticeable. It's not quite what you would expect. I mean, you're familiar with children. You've, you've seen how loud and rowdy they can be, and obviously there's some of that, but you, it, it, it's subdued in, by lack of numbers, if not lack of energy. Hmm. At the top of the stairs, you hear that this, the, sounds, the sounds you were hearing are coming from the far end of the hallway, one of the rooms that you weren't able to see the night before. Um, mm -hmm. I uh, approach down the hallway without much caution. There's sim simply the sounds of children. I'm curious, though, to see, especially as I haven't seen children in Pilot Point so far. Uh, as you come to the door at the end, you glance inside and you see a far larger room. Um, you get the sense that this room takes up most of the upstairs, uh, and it is consists of... Uh, several uh, long table at the back and several rows of what are prob what are desks, although they are not uniform by any stretch. They look as if some were made locally, some were brought in, and some are just a chair with a table by it. Um, towards the front of the room is a chalkboard. Uh, it is uh, again, looks as if it was brought in from outside and haphazardly attached to the wall. And you will see a collection of children of a variety of different ages, ranging from some, you know, some very small to uh, what would look like they could be young teenagers, so probably 13, 14. Mm -hmm. um, and 
there currently, and of course you should also see your old friend, Mr. Tootie, standing at the front. Uh, he is currently writing on the chalkboard with, uh, with his back to the class as the children are, scribbling quickly in their assorted notepads and slates. Um, as you stand there, uh, there are, towards the back, again, there are a couple of, there are some books on, some sh on a shelf, uh, a few scattered toys, uh, a globe that you cannot make out, but you suspect is probably substantially out of date, um, given the changes of the Great War. Why is Austria hungry even on this globe? Um, and... You know, but it, it looks fairly smart. Yeah. I look over the classroom for a moment, like, for all that it is dilapidated and old, it is like a moment of normalcy, which is refreshing after the strangenesses that I just endured in the company of Ogden Colesbury. Um, your, but your, as you look at them, your eye briefly catches that of a fidgeting little girl who eyes widen and waves a little bit before quickly going back to her studies because she knows she's not supposed to be. I faintly smile. Um, and then I, I actually, a thought occurs and I, I approach Tui. Mr. Tui. Um, he is, so Tui is in the middle of, of writing down and he says, now, as, as you know, according to the local, the local history, the, um, moment, I just get up. Pull up my notes here. One second. There we go. Oh, these actually close the wrong tab. I can almost imagine he's just droning on. Yeah, he's totally <laughs> just kind of lost in his own little world. Mr. Tui. All right, well, I was going to look up the name of the actual people who live there, but sure. uh, the local natives uh, had, a, had, a, had a story they told of, uh, of lost creatures, or, of, of animals or plants that would, you know, become become lose their way and, and lose what they are and would disappear from the world, be forgotten by the people and by being forgotten, go away. Now, who can tell me, children, I, uh, oh, oh, uh, uh, ma'am, ma ma uh, miss, uh, uh, welcome, welcome, welcome to our classroom. Uh, children, children, uh, say hello to our guest from out of town. And a very sickening sweet group of kids say, hello! Yeah, like, very awkwardly, hello. Hi. Social chameleon, not good with children. <laughs> um, but I, I, I wave hello to them, and then I turn my attention back to Tui, and I lean in a little bit closer in hopes that it won't be quite as just audible to all of them. And I said, Mr. Tui, I would appreciate a moment with one of your students. Is, is the young man James here? Oh, oh, just about to James. <laughs> oh, yes, uh, of, of, of course, of course. Um, um, James, he points to uh, a young man, and uh, what, what does James look like? Um, Matt. And that's whichever one wants to answer. Do you want Matt H or would, would um, you know one of whoever has an idea? Well, the what last time we saw him, it was covered in, or was that? That was Tom. That, that, that was Tom. Oh, okay. Um, then let's say James is a lanky young gentleman with two bright eyes. I, I mean. Looking at him, he, he doesn't seem off. There's nothing about him that's, that's alarming, and yet you you find yourself alarmed looking because he almost looks like he's 
looking through you or, or past you or doesn't quite see you or indeed anything else. James, mm -hmm. yes, uh, he he looks at you, but it's it's as if he's not as if not quite seeing you. And as, yes, oh, James, please, um, our, our guest would like to speak to you. You are you are excused, of course, from this lesson. Um, uh, I will I will have your peers fill you in when when you return. Um, please, please help her. About uh, he kind of slowly looks over at Alice and says, "All right." stands up and sort of kind of just walks a little bit mechanically towards her and out into the hall and then just kind of stands and stares as if he's waiting. So I follow him out and once we're like either close the door behind us or, or step to the side where I hope that our conversation is not instantly audible to the uh, people in the classroom. And James, um... The, I was told by uh, Mr. Tui that you, in fact, found the black pool in the abandoned caves. And if I recall correctly, you also brought back a sample. And I sort of shudder at that thought of, like, remembering that black pool and, rem and trying to think about that strangeness and that there might even be the vial of the stuff here. Can you, How did you obtain this sample? In, in a glass. My, Mr. I can't remember the names of the people I'm actually. Can't remember the names I actually made. <laughs> Mr. Tuhi, uh, he's been he's been teaching us about learning about the past and taking taking evidence, and I've been I've been working on my badge for that, so I've been carrying. Uh, Carrying carrying containers around and usually use them for, for bait. So you simply reached into it, scooped up some of it in a glass vial. My daddy's a fisherman. He's I've been gutting fish and reaching in and pulling stuff out for as long as I can remember. So, excuse me. I guess that's not something I'm supposed to say to the lady. Uh, but no, yeah, I mean it's just I'm, fine. I'm not, I'm not, not the squeamish sort. Did you notice anything odd? The texture of the material, anything that would help give me a clue that I could communicate home to Pearson and Ives about what this uh, material might be? I pull out my notepad and and flip to a clean page. So it's not to see the writing before. He sort of stares at you for a moment. As if he's kind of trying to remember how to answer. And I says, "Well, it was black, and well, kind of bouncy. Oh, I seemed weird, so I figured I'd bring it back and show the others, show my friends. And Miss Julie really seems to think it's worth something." Showed your friends. You simply, I assume, you just showed them the vial, correct? You, you. Just showed them the vial. Sorry. Uh, yeah. We, uh... You didn't open it, did you? Didn't seem much harm in doing so. Have you touched it? No. I haven't. Guess that's the best way to find out. Did you notice anything else strange by the pool? Any any odd detritus or any other signs of what it might be? No, I'm not sure quite what that means, but I found some pictures on the walls. Those seem pretty strange. Hmm. I'm, I'm, and I'm eyeing him the whole time, like trying to turn, because, you know, I'm not, I'm not bad at reading people. I'm not bad at, at focusing on people, and I'm trying to penetrate this weirdly impassive mask, and I can't, and I can't see what what's beneath, and that's almost more unnerving than anything that I could have gotten from him. 
What's really weird is, too, is you remember him being described as precocious. Yeah. Is that all, man? Yes, James. Thank you. After you help, ma'am, let me know if it's worth anything. He turns and sort of just kind of walks back into the classroom. It's your call. Is the scene over? I think that's probably a pretty good All spot. Right. And, and I think, yeah, her thoughts, like the final thing is that her thoughts are just concern and disconcerted confusion and a strange flash in her mind of a bunch of students running their hands as, as a vial is tipped and black stuff pours out of it and crawls across their fingers. All right. Uh, what is the clue you added in that scene? Um, I originally intended to add the... Um, the little the little story in his last two his lesson, but honestly, that's I think, that, I think that the, well, I think the better clue is James's behavior. So, so the clue is uh, how do you want to phrase it? James's mechanical behavior. Yeah, James's un, unnatural behavior. Unnatural behavior after touching the black stuff. Okay. Right. What trait shall we add to Alice? Maybe um, bad with the kids. Wants normalcy, but doesn't know how to get it. Hmm. Seeker of normalcy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You want to go for that? Seeker of normalcy. And. Uh, update your predictions about what's going on according to our new clues. Again, running through the clues. Charcoal rubbing a strange pictoglyphs. Tommy infected by the black madness. The odd stone knife. The malformed animal skull. James's unnatural behavior after touching the black stuff. So next up, this is going to be me as uh, narrator, Matt S. as witness, and Brandon and Matt H. as the watchers. Um, so this is the first scene in part two, which does not fundamentally um, change anything. This is still an investigative scene. Um, however, your cards may have something that they say about playing in part two as opposed to uh, in part one. Um, we still reveal only one clue per scene. And um, okay, there's one final part of it which we will deal when we end the scene. Okay. So yes. Thinking. Um I'm just I'm checking quickly. Was Alice going to try to catch a train out of town? I didn't get the sense of that. Um, okay. In, in the the sense of like, our, I mean, I think she kind of maybe wanted to send off for further instructions, but she might. I mean, maybe she does want to get out of town. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So actually, I, I mean. Hmm. I'm thinking. Okay. Yes. So, um, here's what I'd like to do. 
Um, the scene is at the train station. The train station probably also functions as the telegraph station, right? Like, because they go hand in hand. So if she wants to send a message back to Juno or Seattle or get any kind of contact back home, um, contact Pearson and Ives. She's most often expected to operate on her own, but these events have been strange and concerning, and she doesn't really even know enough. She can write up a report of the material and attempt to get some read back from experts, but I think in many ways it's it's um, just she's here. Maybe, well, why is she here? Why why now? Why is she sending this message now? Um... Um, well, maybe, uh, well, I can almost see that she would be trying to maybe, uh, have a, have acquired a sample, uh, well, let's see that it's almost wanted to be sending it by mail then, too. Right. Um. I mean, so a short telegram would be like, possibility of oil, uh, mm -hmm. who should I send the sample to? Uh, it's in the local, or it's in the Alaskan area, or no? Because yeah. otherwise it's going to be months before we get back. And, no, that, that, that's great. Like, she's asking, she's inquiring about experts in Juneau. Um, and so, so we have a brief, like, of that of that shot right at the at the railway station, which is again we said was a little higher because you could look out over the small town, and so she's at the railway station and behind her the fog rolls across the town. Even the the the, the later day fog is just is unstoppable, uh, and um, she she stands in front of the desk where the the sole guy at the train station who acts both as the um, uh, you know, the, the guy who takes tickets, who gives tickets, who, who runs the telegrams. Um, he is there tapping away at the device as she's giving him the commands, like this older man, gnarled and, like, uh, crooked and bent and wizened, uh, but wearing the official uniform he's supposed to wear as he taps and taps, uh, following her every word as best as he possibly can, um, which, of course, is taking quite a time. He's not as adept because he doesn't do this very often. Um and so she's standing there for some time, um, as, as cold as seeping into her, um, giving him the message to send and him just tapping slowly and slowly. And eventually it finishes and the message is sent. And it just is a matter of time until some reply will come, one hopes. Um, presumably not instantaneously. It may even take a couple days depending upon any damage to wires or any other issues along the way, the message has a long distance to travel. And the thought of the heard message lost in the ether along the wires, like that image comes up. And then just as we're about to see, maybe she's about to back away, a hand reaches out and grasps her arm from behind, spins her around with, with great force, and and she's looking right into the mad eyes, looking up at her from where he is crouched on the ground, of Tommy. Um, still crazed, looking maybe a bit cleaner, his hair maybe a bit brushed, but still strange and wild-eyed and, and mad-looking. And holding in one hand a piece of cloth clutched in his fingers and the other wrapped around Alice's arm tightly. Uh, un unhand me, Tommy. What do you... I mean, I... It's like, sudden surprise, a shock. It's her face kind of drops. It's like, um... And she's like, yeah, just... Un she's trying to get herself free. And like, what are you doing? Don't... That's not... <laughs> And, and you're trying to push him away, and the conductor, uh, the, the telegram guy, is slowly getting up to like come over and intervene, but he's old and slow, and and you can almost hear the creaking of his bones. And Tommy clutching, clutching at you almost desperately now, a look of, of like, except 
fear in his eyes comes across, and he's and he's like stuttering, trying to say something. His flecks of saliva spill out of his mouth, and he's like, "Buh, buh, 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 buh." Um. I don't. I don't understand, Tom. Just let me go. I, you're gonna get Ogan up here. You're gonna get this conductor fellow out here. Just calm down. The conductor comes over and tries to pull him off, but he's he's young and he's it's actually fairly strong. And the conductor's having no help, no luck. When um, Tommy just knocks the conductor away and. And then he that, that piece of fabric he had clutched in his hand, he pulls it open, and you realize it's like a pant leg uh, ripped off and, and unfolded. And he's holding it up, and you see sketched on it in, in weird, like it's got to be pencil or something or some ink or whatever he found that he could use to sketch on it. You see all sorts of symbols sketched on it, and they're, and they're drawn. They're clearly drawn on. And they look frighteningly like the ones you saw in the cave. Um, Alice doesn't know what to do. Um, <laughs> she's like, hey. He's like pressing it forward at you. Black. Reaches out and takes hold of the pant leg. Uh, she's like, "Oh, good lord, mad kid! What?" <laughs> and you take he looks it. better dressed, anyways. But <laughs> you, you take you take the pant leg, and when you do, his hands start crawling across it, and like he's trying to point at particular symbols on the page. Um, Matt H, what symbols is he pointing at? What symbol? What is like the one he keeps pointing at over and over? It's a triangle symbol. Of course. It's just simple. Triangular. Right there and right here. And all it repeats so often. You you it it recalls something, but you're not quite sure what. Uh, okay, Tommy. Um, she, she's like, oh. Uh, black. I mean, she asked the, the black pool. I mean, and that's black say that, He like starts nodding. Okay. At you desperately, like he's trying desperately to get you to understand something, and you can see it in his face. Like this is not. He's not. His eyes are clear in this moment and wild and desperate, but he's saying something. He's trying to get something across to you. And then that's when the voice of Ogden comes up the hill. Damn it! Tommy Flanagan, damn it! You get your ass back here! Um... Okay, I, I I think Alice is starting to calm down a little bit. She's realizing Tommy's not dangerous. Um, when the sound of Ogan's voice kind of jars her a little bit, it's like um, she kind of watches Tommy to see what his reaction is, but she's almost like she's internally debating whether she wants to try to run away with Tommy and see if she can understand further what he's doing in, but She's also getting the weird vibes from the symbols because she kind of like I don't know if I want to know <laughs> what he's trying to <laughs> convey because that means I probably end up going back to the black pool and I don't know if I want to go back to the black pool. <laughs> and <laughs> when when he hears Ogden's voice, Tommy reacts by trying to force the the pant leg into your hands and like like trying to make you take it. Okay, I mean, Alice will, like, okay. So she has it. She looks a little confused. She starts to fold it up to 
stick it in her satchel. And then he takes one second to draw with a finger. He draws a symbol on the, the platform. Like, and you know, there's it's not like there's ink on his finger, right? It's just he's just drawing it in the air, mm-hmm. on, but on the platform. Brandon, what symbol does he draw? Um, he draws a symbol that looks like a sort of... Um, looks like an S, except it's kind of like a human stick figure. So it's like it's like a stick figure, but you take the main body and you turn it like an S, and there's no um, there's there's no arms, there's just legs, uh, and it's similar to one of the figures that Alice copied down from the wall. In fact, the last one she copied. And he and he draws that the the stick figure that looks like the S with just the legs and like looking at her the whole time, and then he runs. And holding that pant leg in your hands, what did he draw this, the the symbols with, on denim? You don't even know. It smells weird. Well, there's multiple things that I can think of that I used to draw in denim. Uh, there's indigo ink, there's ash, there's charcoal. Uh, I'm sure I can find and figure out what he used. Um, well, let's put this away and hear Ogden uh, trumping along. Or yeah, Ogden. Ogden comes into sight calling, Tommy Flanagan, I am going to tan your ass! And, and then he sees you for a second as he clearly upon the platform through the fog, and he, and he freezes... Um, stops yelling, then he just spits, and he sneers, and he wipes his mouth, and then he moves off into the mists after Tommy. Any last thoughts from uh, Alice? Um, well, I think the biggest thing would be like, wow, uh, Tommy is much more precocious than James was. Um, but seems this black madness malady seems to be very odd and unsettling. But he's a Flanagan as well. Odd that uh, oh, I didn't write down her name. Estelle, the old lady at the house, didn't mention him. But then, if someone's touching the head, they wouldn't mention him. So that's not all. That's but. Um, and I could see her pulling out the pant leg and looking at it closer and like now when he was pointing at the symbol was he trying to say black pool or was he just randomly making sounds when he point okay no I just I was just was seeing if there's any so there's no real correlation to what he was pointing at the thing so okay um, well, who knows um, that's left up to uncertainty at the moment understood and it's, well, I was just wondering if he was making certain sounds when he was pointing at the symbols. That's all. He, um, he, he made the sounds I made. <laughs> um, all right. right. So I'm going to go ahead and play the card Strange Writings. You may play this card after a scene that included mysterious, possibly incomprehensible writings, mm-hmm. uh, which then means from part two onwards you can reveal inexplicable effects that happen when the writings are read or their instructions are followed, or you can reveal the things that the writings described. Um, all right, and the clue I added is not the pant leg, because the pant leg felt a lot like just an echo of the charcoal rubbing, um, because it had similar symbols on it, so I didn't add that. I specifically added the S stick figure symbol with the two legs. That's the clue, that's important, that's special, and that in particular is something noteworthy to Alice. So, what trade are we adding to Alice? And, and we can always choose not to, especially at this point. Anything leap to mind? Nothing in particular for me. Okay, I'm I'm cool holding off then, uh, and not necessarily like I I think that in that scene she was largely reacting, and so I don't think mm-hmm. um I don't think anything necessarily stands out as as an immediate thing, right? Like, or at least anything that's not already on her sheet. 
Okay. So, at the end of the first scene in part two, the narrator of the next scene reads this out. The narrator of the next scene. From now on, at the end of any scene, the witness can begin the journey into darkness that will lead us to the climax of our story, the final horror. The final horror will happen somewhere dark, ancient, remote, or abandoned. This can happen in three ways. If at the end of a scene, the witness decides to go somewhere that looks like a likely candidate for the location of the final horror, and it feels like it's time, the player of the, the witness can initiate the journey with that location as the endpoint. Alternatively, if after a part two scene from the new narrator which is to begin the journey, they can do so by deciding where the final horror will take place and initiating a force majeure scene in which events conspire to force the witness to head for that location. Finally, after three part two scenes, part three begins automatically with a for force majeure scene. The narrator of that scene will decide the location of the final horror. Right. Okay. So, um, so right now, I guess the choice would be um, the witness decides if you want, if the witness is deciding to go somewhere that looks like a likely candidate for the location of the final horror, and if it feels like it's time, you, Matt, as the player of the witness, can initiate the journey. Also, the next narrator is, I believe, you, Matt, right? Or am I well, getting basically, right? part the first one, Matt H, would be able to say. Um, I'm, I'm making sure I have my order right. Okay. So, ba yes. so basically, if at the end of this scene, if the witness decides to go somewhere that looks like it, they can basically well, they're initiating it. You so right can now, actually, you can decide with the scene we just had with the oh, rail okay. with the railway. You can decide as the witness player that now Alice is heading to somewhere for the final horror, and it's time to start that. Also, um, if after a part two scene, the new narrator, which would be you, Matt Schultz, because you are the new narrator, if you wish to begin the journey, you can do so by deciding where the final horror will take place and initiate a force majeure scene in which events conspire to force the witness to head for that location. So those are the two options on the table right now. Either as the witness, you decide that Alice would head there, or as the new narrator, you're going to force the the witness to go there. So it's up to you. If you choose to do neither, that's fine, and then we just have another scene in part two as per usual. Um, and the final thing, actually, to call out would be everybody should also do your leap to conclusions update it, and try and uh, figure out what is now the story. And then you can make your decision, Matt, as to what you would like to do. Okay. I don't know how to work in an S-stick figure with two legs. <laughs> um... So let us know when you have made your decision, Matt S., whether Alice is going to head somewhere and that starts the journey, or whether it's a force majeure scene. Um... Um, da, 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 da. well, 
I mean, as basically as in the last scene, I don't see Alice actually going and trying to get sit down, maybe to go to the Golden Salon and get some food and try to regroup her brain at this point. Sure. <laughs> um, so. Yeah. So it's not starting the journey into darkness, and no, it's not. Are you yeah. gonna make this next scene a force majeure scene, where she is gonna be forced to start the journey into darkness? Um, I don't think so. At least I'm not <laughs> conspiring that way. Of course, now I need a moment to figure out my clue. <laughs> um. The, Okay, so um, so uh, Alice has had uh, walked back from the train station after that very disturbing interlude there with uh, Tommy and Ogren, um, or Ogden, um, and stepped down to the uh, Golden Salmon uh, Tavern and uh, mm-hmm. got herself some lunch. Um, it was a very uneventful, quiet type thing. I, it's a standard saloon or standard tavern. She got some slightly dirty looks going in there. It's not quite. It's not as bad as the old west was, where everyone kind of got all the guys were very falling over themselves because a woman walked into a tavern. Or, but uh, they weren't quite accepting of her being there. Uh mm-hmm. I don't, Other than that, I mean, I, I, oh, I don't really care. Really, they can say or do whatever they like. I'm here to just have something warm to eat because I, I don't know. It's like there's things in my head. I'm just gonna sit down. That's it. Sit down, eat something. It'll be alright. Um. So the. Uh... Barkeep comes over. You have, uh, basically, they don't have a very large selection. Uh, you get some uh, just fish chili. <laughs> Going to be uh, strange, with a... but that and some cheap beer will be just fine. I mean, so yeah, you basically get a bowl of this fish chili. I mean, it smells decent. I mean, it smells better than the. Uh, Rotten fish smell out in the street, um, watered down beer and whatnot. Uh, I mean, so I mean, basically, it's just sort of a calm interlude thing, and uh, no one. I mean, you get some dirty looks, you get some looks. Uh, Ogden comes in about a half hour later. He has branches tied up in his hair, and you hear him. I you hear him mutter some. Uh, Colorful words to some of the other patrons of the tavern as he walks in, uh, or uh, something about Tommy and whatnot. And but as soon as his eyes catch, see that you're there, he gets re- he quiets down. I mean, he's like, uh, and he quiets down. And he orders a drink and he starts drinking. Um, at that, I mean, yes. Yeah, so uh, it's... I am. I am deliberately ignoring him. I mean, I know he's there, but he's not helping, and I don't think there's any way to make him. Uh, so, I mean, so basically, you finish your lunch. I mean, there's nothing. I, I just, um, and you hear the sounds of the children earlier that were in the classroom. You serve here that are in the town hall classroom. You hear them. Uh, down the street a bit as they come out, they're sound they're sounding like a bunch of kids, uh, whatnot. Um, do you do anything? <laughs> I mean, I'm kind of finished up here anyway. Give a brief look over to Ogden and then walk outside. Leave money on the bar. A bartender tips his hat, and uh, so you walk outside, and basically you see the kids uh, sort of storming down the uh, the walkway, uh, and they, uh, 
Oh, you see James sort of walking with his mechanical walk sort of in the back with one or two friends. Actually, there's a couple, there's like three or four, a couple girls, a couple guys. Um, and then I see the little girl that had waved at you earlier run up. It's like, hello again, Miss... Uh... Wait. I'm Emily. You can call me over. Alice, sweetie. That's nice. Hello, nice Miss Alice. Again. Well, it's nice to see you as well. It's, are you enjoying your stay in point? And Pilot point. Pilot point? I mean... It's... I will admit it's... It's very homey here. Very... I don't know if I've ever heard anyone say it's homey here, but it's nice of you to say. Very rustic, yes. That's, rustic is a good word for it. Um, and as she's talking to you, a couple of other friends come up and they're all smiling at you. It's like, oh, are you... Are like, What's it like compared to the city? I've heard the city has really tall buildings that go way up into the sky. Yeah, way up there. You, Some of them even have five or six stories on them. It's amazing. You see the little mouths like, oh, wow, five, six stories. So cool. Um, Can I ask and, you a question, sweetie? What's wrong with uh, James and his friends over there? They're acting kind of weird. Um, she gets a slightly frightened look on her face. She looks back. And says, oh, that's James. He sort of, uh, I heard he got whip, a uh, whooping from his paw. It's, um, he went exploring the caves and he wasn't, he was told not to, uh, uh. Well, I mean, all right. I mean, I'm not here to pry. Just... Just a little worried, that's all. Well, I'm sure he'll be fine once he can sit back down without having to wince too much. Uh, it's... But I'm going to get myself some nickel candy, so I'll see you see you around, Miss Alice. Here's nickel for you, sweetie. Enjoy. <laughs> you just give out one nickel? It's like all the other guys like, ooh. It's like, all right, I'll lucky. Give out, I mean, I'll give out a couple of nickels to kids. I mean, I don't know. Oh, you, you got okay. <laughs> you got a bunch of happy little cute girls, little boys. Uh, they go rushing off to thing. Um, James and and his cohort sort of look at you and or well, not. They look at you, but not look at you, kind of deal. Um, and then you see Mister Tuhees uh, cross the street. Um, and he's walking towards you. It looks like he might be uh, going to the general, walking over to the general store. Um, um Mr. Tuhi. Um, hi. Oh, hello, Miss Ellis. Uh, Eckhart. How yes. are you today? Did you was James I, helpful to you? I sent off a message earlier. To Pearson and Ives, of course. Um, have oh, excellent. You noticed, here. Have you noticed uh, some strange behavior from James and those children over there? You know, the four that are staring and not staring at the same time? Oh, well, uh, I didn't mention this, but James did get in some trouble going to that pool. Uh, of course... The unfortunate incident with Tommy hasn't helped matters too much with that. Um, I, I'm sorry, What what's happened to Tommy? Last I heard, he was not doing well. Well, I mean, he has the, what they call, like to call around here, the black madness. Um, I, I'm sorry, could, could you elaborate on that? I, I don't mean to be direct or pry, but that doesn't mean anything to me, really. And he's not very coherent. Well, he's always had a bit of a stutter, stuttering problem, but uh, he's a good kid. Uh, he's a bit of a wild child. He likes to go out. Um, he used to be a very good student, but um, I guess it's been... Eckhart leans back and thinks of it. Um, six months back? No, no, not that long. 
Yeah, maybe it's been six months. Uh, sometime around uh, after the first after the first uh, ice melt in springtime, uh, he came back a bit odd from his explorations. Uh, Ogden's had him well in hand, and uh, Ogden's a good has uh, always been a uh, a fine, upstanding member of the community, I suppose. Well, yes, I mean, he's he's served the Flanagans very well over time. I mean, he he used to be their oh, what's the Brown. word I'm looking for? It's not a butler. I they're me, they're men of business. I uh, that was a long time ago. I mean, that was no, he still might have some loyalties there. Um, but no, it's I think James mostly just got in trouble with his dad, and he's kind of a, and he's just being a moody child now. And, I, I the see. others, though they are model students now. I must say they aren't cutting up in class anywhere near as much as they used to, I mean, which is very good. They're learning a lot. They ask a lot of questions. That's good, I suppose. I. It doesn't. I, I don't suppose you've been a native of this town your entire life, have you? Not my entire life. Uh, it's only been the last 20 years. I moved here about, it's, I guess, yeah, about 20 years ago. I was a young fellow when I came here. I was not quite the downward spiral at this point, but uh, I came. I was able to start teaching. Has there um, been any other instances of strange behavior? It pauses and things. Um... Well, there's always been a case or two of the black madness. Um, nothing serious. Usually, it, it, I, usually the kids either grow up and grow out of it, or they just uh, disappear after a time. Um, they move on. They go. They take the ride on the train and they disappear into the greater woods. It, you know how it is. I mean, it takes weeks, oh. a few days to get out here, and I mean, once you go a month or more, it's you may never hear back from them, so. Uh, uh, of course. Uh, well, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm sure I'll be hearing from Pearson and Ives soon. Uh, maybe just take care of a little more business here in town before I head out. Hopefully good news. I mean, I, I'm really hoping that... that uh, that they would be very interested both for the archaeological stuff and the uh, the oil as well. I mean, you I hope they're most interested. Be, I mean, they wouldn't have left any old mining equipment, you know, for repurposing. That 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 would certainly cut down on the um, initial costs. Hmm. Well, I'd probably have to check the records. Um, I do think there are some. There is some old mining equipment. I just don't remember who, 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 uh, which, who has it anymore. Um, most of that stuff was kind of left in the mines where they were where they were mining because most of it was very almost too heavy to move back out or not cost effective enough to move it back out. Um, of course it was. That I mean, of course. Regardless, I, I am grateful for all your assistance. Um, yes. I feel... I don't know. Hmm. Well, I'm always glad to be of service. Um, I hope you haven't had any too much trouble here. Uh, no. no, no just, uh, just the occasional odd incident, but that's, that's not out of place for anywhere. To be honest. Well, especially when you're still new, so new. I mean, you've only been here a day. I mean, so everything all seems a little odd and out of place. I, I, I mean, imagine compared to your big city. I mean, I imagine if I went back, went to Juno or Seattle, I'd be thinking all kinds of weird things. I mean, they probably have all newfangled gadgets and of course knickknacks. Right. Regardless, I, thank you for your time. Oh, you're quite welcome. 
And so he turns and he starts to walk into the general store. Um, it's a shame they didn't have any dynamite. All right. <clears throat> or at least not accessible. Um, okay. Uh, I, I mean, I, I would say more than likely you probably could go to the general store. They might actually sell dynamite in the general store, but... <laughs> no, I mean, it's not that kind of, uh, of story. Mm-hmm. Out of character. Oh, okay. Gotcha. I mean, all right. No, I saw it. Well, let's see it in there. Um, okay. So what is the clue that you're adding? Uh, that they're... Uh, disappearances that have been written off. Um, yeah, the people have been running off for years. Yep. So usually people that have the Black Madness either stick around town or they just disappear totally. Okay, wrote that in. Uh, do we, let's uh, see, do, is there anything we want to add to Alice? Hmm. Hmm. I want to say no. Okay. I, mean, I don't know yeah, if I'm going to do it. All right. And so, uh, beyond revising your leap to a conclusion, which we should all do, write a new leap to a conclusion, incorporating all our clues. Um. So Matt H would um. Alice begin her journey into darkness? I think so. I mean, I'm not sure how we're going to have that happen. Well, that basically means if at the end of the scene the witness decides to go somewhere that looks like a likely candidate for the location of the final horror. So does Alice decide to go somewhere at the end of the scene that is a likely location for the final horror? Yes. Where? Um, let's say she's going to return to... Uh, I'm torn. Because it's either the, the mansion or it's the pool itself. Let's have it be the mansion. I, I think that that's... Um, where this has been leading. Okay. So... Okay, so she's heading into the mansion, or she's heading to the mansion, so we will begin the journey into darkness with the mansion as the final uh, destination. Um, All right, so everybody revise your leap to conclusions, or leap to a new conclusion. And then our next narrator would be you, Matt H. So, um, would you like to read the section from the teaching guide out before the journey into the darkness? The new narrator reads this part out. Okay. We're about to start a new part of the game called the journey into darkness. This part is a single extended scene, and during this scene, we're all going to take turns describing the journey to the location of the final horror. A turn doesn't involve a lot of talking, just a few sentences. On your turn, unlike the rest of the game, you have free choice over what role to take. If you choose to be narrator, you describe the environment and move the journey on. If you choose to be a witness, you describe your inner thoughts and fears. If you choose to be a watcher, you elaborate on whatever the previous player describes. We play through at least 12 turns, starting with the 12th turn. If we choose to be narrator, then we can describe the witness's arrival at the final location at the location of the final horror and end the journey. On the 16th step, if we get that far, we must do this. So again, to be clear, 
before the twelfth turn, they can't arrive at the destination, which is the mansion. And up until then, we're taking turns to fill in what happens along the journey, starting with Matt. You can take the role of the narrator and describe the environment the witness encounters on the journey. You can take the role of the witness and describe in a few sentences the witness's sense of foreboding and horror. Or you can take the role of watcher, elaborating on what the previous player narrated. Okay. Okay? All right, so you're up first, Matt. All right. So, Alice, having left the general store with Mr. Tuhi, you walk into the street, and you swear the sky was clear. Everything was uh, crystal clear. The sky was blue. And now, fog. Fog as far as the eye can see. And thick fog. It's difficult to see to the other side of the street. And distorted. The... the Sensation of sound is strange here, and it, it as always, smells like rotten fish. Nice. Okay, so the next person is branded. So go ahead. Um, Alice's thoughts are on, on, are conflicted. Are are she's at war with herself because. She is a rational woman. She is a professional woman, and rationality is telling her two separate things. It is telling her that there cannot be something strange and twisted about this town, but at the same time, it is telling her that there is evidence that something is wrong. And so she kind of, she sort of finds her feet moving without thinking, um, and she knows that she has to reconcile one of these two parts, one of these rationalities that contradict each other. And she also wonders at that vial. She wonders, is it safe where it is? She wonders what would happen if it were sent to Seattle to be tested? Who would touch it? What would become of it? Because it, it can't possibly bring harm. That doesn't make any sense. But at the same time, these children, there's something wrong with them. Something is happening here, and she has to deal with it. Yeah, and, and as she's even thinking, something's wrong with these children, and she has to deal with it here. Looking at the thick, soupy fog, the distorting fog that she's now walking through as she tries to make her way to the mansion, she thinks she sees forms flickering flickering in and out of sight um, at the edges of her vision, following her or, or moving alongside her, next to her, or right behind her, or even in front of her beckoning onward. And for a moment she thinks she sees James, and, and then he's back into the fog, and she thinks she sees a friend of James's, and it's like they're, they're coming along with her and watching her as she goes but she can't ever see them for more than a split second, so she can't ever be sure. Um, uh, so ba I mean, basically she's taking walking on uh, hesitant steps as these flickering things happen around her, uh, continuing to move... Um, And I basically, in the, so for the, as the this fog has rolled in, all of a sudden the a, lar, a loud fog horn goes off in the distance. You can just hear it booming strangely through the uh, fog. Is and uh, for what I mean, it's just odd that all of a sudden it's like she hears the fog horn, and all of a sudden she can hear like the bells from the boats that were down in the. Uh, port and it's like yeah <laughs> so for clarification was that one turn no that was four turns okay yeah. so it's back to you Matt okay um And as she's following the road, or at least you're, she's fairly sure that this is still the road, something looms up out of the fog at her, and it is, it's the deer. 
almost impossibly, going in the opposite direction, moving past her, and she stumbles and watches as the, the deer run past her in the fog and lands on the ground. And the deer go over and past, and she is alone. And yet, is she? How does she know? Ah, as she goes through the mist, um, she presses onward because there's no going back at this point. The world has become a confusing mess, and if she diverts from the path she is currently on, she will become lost. Uh, it is a, as if she is drawn forward ever deeper into this mist and just as it seems that she is lost that she has she cannot find her way she emerge it, it seems to almost peel back that she emerges and while the, the sky is still cloudy while while the mist still presses in she sees the house before her um, this strange old house that is connected to her and she sees movement in one of the upper windows um, and she she steps towards the door but for the first time has no idea what to say isn't sure where to go from here and uh, she stopped at the door by the sight of what she didn't notice last time she was here on the door handle, um, a symbol, uh, an engraving upon the door handle that looks faintly like an S, but with two legs coming from the end, and with the head. And it's it's engraved in a way to be so as to be a, an artistic design, a pattern. Um, but it's clearly there, and she sees it now. Her eyes can't move away from that, and her hand can't touch the handle. Uh, and she takes a step back as the, she feels herself unable to touch this handle, and just the thoughts going through her head, it's like... Um, Am I going to disappear? I mean, I, I'm i not suffering from this black madness, plague, whatever. Am I? Why am I so apprehensive? Um, just, it's probably just a random symbol that Tommy drew in the air. Just nothing more. No, no reason to be scared. Uh, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's all that. Hmm. And yet, you do try the handle. It's almost as if she can't stop herself. And it's unlocked. Perhaps it's always been unlocked. Perhaps this place has been waiting for you. You specifically, this whole time. You can't, you can't help but bring your thoughts back to that for some reason as you step inside the house. And the fog is here. It shouldn't be here, but it is here inside the house, inside every room. And you wander the first floor, and nothing. Of course it wouldn't be here on the first floor. No. No, it would be underground. And you know where that is. You shouldn't, but you do. The stairs down to the basement. And you begin your descent. So I'm going to say that they arrive at the location of the final horror. You can't yet, because that was only number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Oh, so okay. Not there yet. I'm sorry. That's okay. My apologies. Uh, as you are heading back towards the stairs, um, 
you hear the kind of croaking, clearing of a throat, and you turn and you see um, the owner of this house, and she's standing there again, looking at you calmly, studying you, looking, weighing opportunities, and you find yourself wondering, who is Tommy's parents? How is he related to this woman? Well, who else is living in this house? And she sort of kind of tilts her head and doesn't seem necessarily upset that you've broken her house and simply says, you know, so have you thought what you came here for? Have you found what you've been looking for? Is there something valuable here that you want to you want to bring to the rest of the world? And I think in that moment, that is when, like, that question posed almost snidely or, or sarcastically, is there something here that you found that you want to bring to the rest of the world? It freezes in her mind, and, and Alice suddenly is not Alice with the same crippling fear she's an Alice driven by an almost animalistic response of there is something here that should not be and the only res the only appropriate thing is to either strike out at it or to run and she says I'm about to find out with that fear creating the slightest tremble in her voice. But that resolve giving her what she needs to continue down the stairs. And so now this is, just to call it out, this is the 12th, so from this point forward anybody can say you arrive. Okay. Well, if you choose to be the narrator. If you choose to be the narrator, which means to describe the environment the witness encounters on the journey, yes. Yeah. Um, so. This is Matt S. Yeah. It would be me. I'm trying to decide if I want to be the narrator. I, I think I. Um, so basically, Alice has walked down the stairs, um, the creepy old lady upstairs. <laughs> sort of slowly, you can hear this sound of her footsteps sort of following you as you walk down the stairs. Um, let's see. Uh, so I, uh, yeah, so, I mean, is that all basically? So basically you've gone down the stairs, you're now in this old basement. Um, and we have arrived at the end. <laughs> the end of the right. journey. Yeah, no, that's fair. You described the transition to the final place, but not necessarily the environment. Yeah. Understood. Um, okay. So now, the final horror. Yay! Um, okay. Who's the player to the left of the last narrator? That was Matt S. Matt H. So Matt H., go ahead and read the teaching guide part. All right. We're about to reach the final scene of the game. The witness is going to see the true far horror that has so far only been hinted at. The scene will either involve a direct encounter with a monster or a revelation of world-shattering proportions. Maybe both. One of us has to volunteer to decide what the true horror is and be the narrator for the scene. We've all been writing our ideas down as we go, so this shouldn't be too hard. The narrator, narrator will have to weave a horror that explains all the clues we've seen so far but they needn't explain it all to us during the scene as long as they don't ignore any of the clues entirely. Um, Brandon, you're next. Yep. To help give an idea of the sort of things that might happen at the climax of a final horror scene, there are some examples from Lovecraft himself. Here are some examples from Lovecraft himself. In one story, the witness discovered they are descended from the monster. In another, the witness discovered that they have to assume to be paintings of imagined grotesques or photographs of real-life subjects. In a third, after devastating and painting the location of the story, the monster simply leaves, demonstrating the irrelevance of the witness. Okay. So for the final horror, BBDBD, 
to actually call it out. Um, right, it, there are two main types of final horror, which are either an encounter with some kind of entity or a horrifying revelation. The narrator for the final horror is whoever has a great idea for it. They will then be responsible for weaving the clues together for the big reveal, as usually this is not something to discuss. Anyone who has an idea simply says so without saying what their idea is. If there's more than one such person, then the person who played the narrator in the last full scene before the journey into darkness gets to narrate the final horror. There are ideas for characteristics of monsters and for revelations that could be used in the final horror in the inspiration tables. Uh, so on and so forth. Can we just, I just wanted to make sure real quickly that I have all the clues correct. I've got the charcoal rubbing, I've got the black madness, the knife, the malformed skull, James's unnatural behavior, Tommy's ripped pants. Um, was there anyone else I was missing? The disappearances of people for years written off uh, by the town. People with black madness either stick around in town or disappear totally. And the, the pants were the S-stick figure symbol with two legs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, who has an idea for the final horror? I've got one. Yeah, I mean, I, I have one too, but I am more than content to yield it to you. I mean, we all have something. But <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we all have some idea. Um, well, it's it's a matter of um, it, what it says is if there's more than one person, then the last person to have a full scene before the uh, final, the, the journey into darkness gets it. And so if I recall correctly, that person was Matt H had the most direct scene, and then so it would be Matt S, then me, then Brandon. Should right. be should be the order of priority. Um that's assuming everybody wants it, right? Because uh, if you if you don't want it, if you don't think you have a good idea, then that's fine. So um, I'll see it to next in line. Okay. Um, Matt S, did you want it? No, nothing. Okay, then I will take it because this is going to be crazy. Should be crazy. Um, all right, so that's me, and then. Uh, okay. The witness is played as before by the person to the narrator's left. Their role is chiefly to be appropriately horrified and powerless. We may see them flee the scene, though not before the narrator has finished describing the true awfulness of the final horror. Lose consciousness or even be devoured or otherwise destroyed. What happens to the witness is, in this scene, of little consequence, for they are no longer center stage. Indeed, it is worth considering some of the different ways Final Horror can play out from the witness's perspective. I'm not going to worry about that. Um, and yes, so the person to my left is... Who's the per it's Matt S. I keep looking at this and getting confused which way we did it. So Matt S., you are playing the witness. Uh, you are playing Alice in her horror as she is encountering this final scene. Um, okay, so... You come down into the basement, and there's barely any light. Just the faintest what trickles down from above. Um, and there's a moment where you're, you're trying to look around and, and become accustomed, like have your night vision come. Um, but then from upstairs, allow me to help comes Eleanor's voice, and then a switch is, is flipped, and lights flare up um, strangely. Gas lanterns like light up almost all over this basement, and, and uh, light fills the room. And it's this bizarre, spread-out, long basement laboratory. There are tables full of strange... Um, beakers and alembics and uh, glassware of myriad sorts and uh, there are um, 
bizarre vats, brass or, or bronze or iron or steel um, spread all over with spigots and buckets, buckets covered in odd materials and strange sludge. There are um, tables with manacles at the top and the bottom slanted up against the wall uh, with with wheels to turn them, to straighten them out or not, many of which are, are stained red or brown. The entire place, as soon as you, you take in all of this strangeness, it's a stench comes into your 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 nose. This this bizarre, nightmarish, metallic smell, and the scent of fish mixed with it. And and you you can't look anywhere without seeing something something that catches your eye and drives you just a little bit more into the clutches of fear. You look to one side and you see an entire glass cabinet full of strangely shaped animal skulls lined up, each one labeled with a little placard. And you look into another the corner of the room and you see a, an array of different strange knives lined up and prepared, each one ready to be used, some of them tarnished. Um... <laughs> Uh, yeah, basically Alice would be like uh, creeping down. It's like um, I almost see her trying to dig in her satchel before the gas lanterns come on and trying to find her flashlight. And all of a sudden, the, the glare of the lanterns make her shield her eye, make her shield her eyes, and it's like blinking away. as like as a look, slow look of her professional demeanor kind of crumbling as this this scene unfolds, and it's like her breathing becoming very shallow and almost hyperventilated. It's like... <laughs> I mean, she almost like she's trying to ask what's going on, but just at a loss for words. It's like... And it's like she's almost starting to fumble at her bag as she's trying to start... just going from scene to scene, almost starting to turn around. As Ele she... Eleanor comes down the stairs slowly. She says, aren't you impressed? It's our family's work. Really, we've done amazing Family's things work? here. Amazing things here. Absolutely amazing. She saunters around the tables, her hand running across glass devices, her strange, long-fingered, like, yellowed hand... And she comes to stand before, like, a, a it almost looks like a, a, some, so a well, and it's covered with a heavy metal cover in the middle of all of this strange laboratory equipment. Um, and she, like, places her hand on top of the well. And you see on top of the well is that, is that S symbol again engraved in the metal. She says, it really, when, when we first made the discoveries, it was completely unexpected. But the doors it opened, the doors it opened were incredible. We had no idea of the true value of this place, that it lay nowhere near the gold that we first came here for. Now we Flanagans learned the true value of this place lay in, in knowledge, in, in exploration of, of what it could mean to be human. What, what do you mean, what it could be to be human? As Alice sort of starts backing away, keeping like dark, her eyes darting between Eleanor and the stairs, like... Yeah, and and she she snaps her fingers actually, and there's this weird noise. As something sort of comes comes out of a different corner of this laboratory and it comes slinking amidst the tables, and you can barely see it uh, uh, part of it above the tables. And but but 
eventually it comes into view, its chains dragging across the floor with that horrible scraping noise. Matt, what what does it look like? This this horrible monstrous creature, this this human post human. I'm assuming me, Matt, but it's not it's humanoid, certainly, for the moment, at the very least. The head elongated, the mouth full of sharp teeth. Staring, but not quite seeing. There's something wrong with the eyes. You 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 can't tell what, but it doesn't it doesn't matter. And the arms are atrophying. It, it almost as if it doesn't need them. No, just moving slowly. She says, this is my husband. I'd like you to meet Daniel. One of the first. Okay. <laughs> uh, Alice just freaked out. I was like, <laughs> like, and I could just see, I mean, she's like, husband? Okay, uh, go ahead. <laughs> one, one of the first of us. He truly pushed the boundaries, and he didn't reach full transcendence, but he paved the path for us to follow. We're ever so grateful to him. And as she says it, she like runs her hand along his oddly elongated skull and his horrible like jutting teeth and his atrophied arms. You see, as we learned more about what was here, we learned that, that the people here understood it. They knew that this this blackness gave us a, a, a means to the mind of a god. It gave us the essence of something so far beyond us, as far beyond us as we are beyond ants. They knew that they could call it into themselves. They could create their their prophets and chosen ones, and in exchange, it would grant to them gifts. All it needed was the bodies of some of their people, and they would survive even here in this horrible, wretched wasteland. They wrote their rituals down. It took a bit of work to translate it. And, and she reaches over and takes a book and she opens the book and you see like an endless scrawl of, of those symbols taken from the pictographs. Uh, all of them translated. And like there, there's, there's text uh, written in English but even looking at it, the words are like written in horrible handwriting and looking at it hurts your eyes. And we could refine it. It took work. It took work. Much work. But the people here are hardworking and hardy. And they're used to terrible tragedy. So what if one of them periodically went mad? So what if one of them periodically went missing? It was all for the good of this place. It was all for the good of humanity. I can see I was just sort of looking around. It's like, he, and almost like she's trying to pull the professional demeanor she's she's come to rely on. It's not quite making. It's like, of course, madam, of course, you do what you have to do. And like, I just gotta get out. I mean, the thought running through is like, escape. I need to get out. She's gonna want to use me in this thing. No, it's not real. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> it, you see, you see, what we learned was how to make this this godhood, this liquid deity, work for us. Instead of being slaves to it, we could command it. And it took so long and so many sacrifices 
She gestures to the cabinet with all those odd, misshapen skulls. And it becomes clear to you now, looking at it, how many of them are actually human skulls. It took so much. But we got there. And we learned, we Flanagans learned, how to make ourselves better. Perfect. It didn't, it didn't always work. Poor Tommy. Poor Tommy. His body rejected it. He was never the same. We've tried to let him continue his life, but that may have to change now. I mean, basically, Alice is torn between running and is like, what do you mean you perfected it? Uh, he's your husband. Tommy's insane. I finished the work. I thought you would would be able to understand. It took a special mind to be able to see the connections, to to finish the path, not the bludgeoning cruel, stupid mind of a man. But my mind. A woman's mind. The mind of a mother. That's what it took to finish it. And she reaches out, she takes a knife from that cabinet of knives, and it looks like that odd stone knife from from before, and, and she, she just takes it, and she actually starts cutting down her body, starting like right at her throat. Um. Blood seeps from the wound, but the blood is black and strange and tarry. And the more she cuts, the more it starts to to wave out like like tentacles reaching out from this cut on her chest reaching out towards you. Okay, no. <laughs> Alice is like, uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Too much. Um, she reaches into her satchel and has, has drawn her gun and is shaking, and almost a shaky hand, like backing up the staircase. No, this isn't happening. You, whatever. I'm not part of this. Let's. I'm leaving. You're going to let me go. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. No, my, my dear Alice, you share our blood. You are part of this. Come. I have something to show you. And this, this horrible tentacly mass, she starts stepping forward along with her husband at her side in this horrible form. And she runs one hand lovingly across that S shape. And as she does, there's a second where it looks like it, it flickers, like it's alive. And then those two metal grates rip back away from the well. And you hear a horrible noise coming from deep in the well. Brandon, what what noise is coming out of the well? You're muted, sir. It's the noise of the tide, only it's not the tide. It's no longer just the lapping of waves. It is, it's the eternal crashing. It's the sound of mountains being worn down, of rock being turned to dust, of the ever-present lapping of, an, um, of that strange black liquid going on and on forever, consuming everything over, and eventually wearing even the very earth beneath it, to nothingness. And that noise pours out of the well, fills Alice's ears. And she says, Your godhood waits. Uh, <laughs> I think Alice could be trying to run away at this point in time. <laughs> You, you like... run you run back up the stairs um, <laughs> and that horrible creature that is her husband atrophied 
with with the atrophied arms, his legs are not, and they pound powerfully after you as you race up the stairs, closing the distance upon you, and then his jaws snap around Alice's ankle, tearing through her pants, drawing blood out of her leg. Eliciting a scream from her, like, no! And she fires off her pistol a few times. Fires off a revolver. <laughs> I let go. And, no. and you fire the revolver into him, and blackness just pours out of the holes where each bullet tears into his body. And Eleanor looks up and says, Now, now, dear. It'll all be okay. And he drags you back down. No! <laughs> I can see her losing her grip on her revolver, trying to catch hold of the stairs to prevent herself from being dragged down. No. Uh, yeah, and I feel like um, that's where <laughs> black screen that, that scene cuts out. Is that is that if that's cool with everybody? Oh, that's, um, yeah, that's fine. All right, so the epilogue. Now we do the epilogue, and that's this is the last part. And here we go. Um, Our story has concluded. We're going to have an epilogue to reveal a little of what happens next, both to the witness, but also to the horror they encountered. We don't play this out, but just narrate it, either as a scene or a series of short scenes, or perhaps through another medium, like a newspaper article that we read out loud. The narrator's role is to decide what happens to the horror. They have to show how the horror is still out there in the world in some form. Even if our witness somehow managed to de defeat the horror, their job is to show that the that this was a hollow victory with no real long-term impact. And the witness has a part to read. And the witness is Matt H., so go for it. The player of the witness says what has become of the central character. They have to show how the witness's life has been destroyed by the things they have seen. Even if the witness has died, they will show how the effects of their encounter with the horror will ripple, ripple out after their death. By the way, we can narrate these two segments, the fate of the witness and the fate of the horror, in either order, or interweave the two. So, first watcher. Go for it, Brandon. All right, so... Um, in an exception to the rules so far, anyone who wants to can add elaborations and details on what the others narrate, including the narrator and the witness themselves. We want to spin a doom-laden ending and really lay it on thick, so don't hold back. Okay. So, narrator, go for it. All right, so basically it's... Um, the telegraph operator has come down from the station. He's gone to the... Golden Salmon Saloon. He's gone or a tavern and walked up the stairs, and knocks on the door. It's like Miss Eckhart, Miss Eckhart, your telegram has arrived. Um, whereupon, oh. yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Thank or, you. I mean, basically, I'm saying she is alive, and the door opens. There she is. So, go ahead. <laughs> yes. Thank you. As always, I do appreciate the help. Oh, you're welcome, Miss Eckhart. You're welcome. Um, basic, and the old man walks away and trapes down the stairs, and uh, Alice is there, uh, looking none the worse for wear from where we left last her off. Um, looking a little pale, a little wan, a little darkness behind the eyes. Um, but the contents of the letter is, uh, yes, please send. Uh, oh, I wouldn't say. Uh, send sample. Stop. Or send sample to Seattle office. Stop. Uh, 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 chemist Sanders uh, at university. Stop. Um, Pearson and Ives. Uh, so, and so basically, it's a call for the sample to be delivered to. Of course, I don't. You know, Auntie Eleanor, I, I think that this is moving too slowly. Are, are you sure we could... I, I mean, there's these nice young men at Miskatonic who expressed interest in it just last week. We could send more than one sample, is all I'm saying. You know. Uh, there's then the 
scene changes to a uh, few years later. There's a newspaper headline, and it just says, "As you know, war in Europe am- imminent." On underneath, there's a sub story that just says, you know, "United States government approves expedition uh, approves uh, major operations to." unlock oil reserves found in Alaska. Nice. Oh, that's excellent. I almost feel like that's a perfect place to end it. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I like that. It's... <laughs> oh, God. Wow. <laughs> we just turned, like, drilling for oil in Alaska into unleashing Eldritch Horrors. That's that awesome. awesome. Of course. <laughs> that's Ooh. awesome. All right, um, and I believe then that is the end of our tale. Um, so thank you, all of you. Thank you, Matt, Brandon, and Matt, for sticking around. This went longer than I'd expected, and I sort of see what was meant by uh, the game designers when they said that it really needs three to four hours, but that's not a bad thing, because I had a lot of fun, and I think we created a pretty yeah. awesome story at the end. Um yeah, so thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you, everybody who watches this. Uh, the game, again, was Lovecraft-esque. It is still currently on Kickstarter, uh, and the link will be in the description. And the creators are Becky Anderson and Josh Fox. Uh, and so thank you very much to them for making it. And uh, if you enjoy this, please go ahead and subscribe to Indie Plus. Uh, we do lots of other cool videos, lots of other cool exhibition games. Uh, we do panels, we do Chain World, we do lots of cool stuff. So go ahead and subscribe by pushing the button down there, and uh, you will get to see all kinds of other cool stuff. And otherwise, once more, thank you, Matt, Brandon, and Matt, <laughs> uh, again, so much. I was really happy with our tale, because that was kind of, that made me happy. Oh, poor Alice, that felt so much like a Lovecraft tale. That was awesome. Yes. Um, <laughs> all right. Thank you. Um, have a good night. Good night. Good night.